three, two, one. Welcome to the David the Dog Trainer podcast, episode eighty nine. Today we're joined by a good friend, colleague, mentor, Tyler Mudo from Buffalo, New York. Let's see if we can get him on. Recording in progress. Entering the room. Yeah, dang! I I always thought his name was his last name was like M U D D O, like Mudo. Nah, dude. <laughs> I've been saying I've been saying it right but wrong in my head, I guess. Get a little bit of volume here for him. All right. Looks like he's getting his thing on. <coughs> Tyler, your microphone is not on, or your video, <laughs> or both. There Sorry, I just had to step away from the desk for a minute. What's happening, man? Um, yeah, I heard you guys talking about my last name, though. I had my headphone in. <laughs> I was not have been at the yeah, desk. That was my fault. <laughs> get that shit right, man. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> What's going on, man? Yeah, it's people say people say it all kinds of different ways too. Yeah. So, oh. Yeah, even like within my family, people say the name differently because <laughs> there's like the Italian way of saying it, and then like the Americanized way of saying it. Dope. What's new? Same old man. Well, I mean, other than the fact that like I don't have like a massive business over my shoulders anymore, but <laughs> beyond that, just uh, doing my thing. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, I'll obviously let you do like a formal introduction. We've oh. we've talked about you here and there on the podcast before, so I mean, I'm sure you know. Obviously, people know who you are. Um, you know, sure. we met each other. You've talked like, about me on the podcast. Yeah, dude, we did an episode <laughs> one time where we were just like watching like YouTube videos and just talking them. We pulled up a couple of years. One of them in particular. Remember that like German Shepherd handoff video you had? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Smooth that we pulled that one. Yeah. Up. We were looking at that one. All positive cool. things. Um, so I, we, I don't even remember when it was that I first came out. You actually, you know what it was? It was right around the time when your leash reactivity came out on Leerberg. Because I remember seeing that, I got that course, and right away, like I was pretty early into dog training at that time. I think I'd been training for maybe like two years, like under somebody, and was like kind of fresh in my new thing and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. I was like, man, I want to get out there and, you know, start learning from you. I mean, like that was the first time I'd seen information really like presented in such a like systematic way. Right. Um, yeah. And that's a, the one thing I think that a lot of people really love about you is how you're able to like articulate and put information out there. So, yeah, we met each other around then. I came out a handful of times. And uh, again, mm -hmm. I, I credit you to, to so much of, of the success I've had in dog training. I mean, you taught me a lot of things that I know now and use to this day. And, uh, you know, you've been a, a great source of information through you know, any sort of hurdles and stuff I've faced. So why don't you go ahead and give kind of just the cliff notes uh, version of, you know, what you did, what you do now um, and stuff like that. Are we recording already? Yeah. Like we're like oh dude, we're, we're rocking. We yeah, we're right away. Oh man, you guys waste no time. No. All right, um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, like, totally unprepared. <laughs> we're <Wow>. on. <laughs> uh, yeah, sweet. Um, yeah, uh, so uh, yeah, I've been training dogs for a long time, um, and uh, founded a relatively large training center and uh ran that for many years and um you know throughout that time also was uh traveling around the world teaching seminars and um doing a lot of one-on-one -on -one coaching as well with individual trainers um and then uh after my kids were born i started getting more into developing online courses and things like that i wanted to cut back on my travel because i wanted to be home more with my family and then uh, at a certain point, I just sort of cut it out altogether. I focused a lot on my online business, Consider the Dog, which is like a really cool educational platform that we have. And um, and then, yeah, these days I spend the bulk of my time um, actually coaching professional trainers. So I don't really do much these days with like the actual dog owners. I'm more developing dog trainers and helping them develop best practices with like virtually anything from just their overall like understanding um, technique, but also just like business management. Cause again, I, I ran a like full scale behavior center for a while and also was on the board for the IACP and served as president. So I have a pretty diverse um, sort of set of experiences within the industry that I think 
is relatively unique. And um, I'm really happy to be able to offer that to helping helping professionals essentially be able to do the best that they can do for themselves, but also provide the best that they can for their clients as well. Because there are a lot of, um, I think there are a lot of gaps in like traditional dog trainer education that need to be filled. And that's been sort of my mission over the past couple of years now is, is trying to fill some of those gaps. Yeah. I think, um, I think one of the interesting things like we were discussing yesterday when we were texting, um, is, you know, the fact that you grew like, not just like, Hey, I'm a dog trainer that goes and works with owners and stuff like that. But you grew a company, right? You had a staff, you offered many services, mm-hmm. right? Like it was a larger scale operation than your typical dog trainer, obviously. And you got mm-hmm. that to a place where you're able to obviously, like you sold it, right? You walked away from it and it mm-hmm. still operates to this day, right? Very well, right? Uh, yeah. You had these yeah. kind of very, like you were saying, like turnkey operation style. I think that in itself is a very uh, interesting thing to a lot of people because so many dog trainers, I think it's stuck in this wheelhouse of like, you know, you are the dog trainer, right? And you have people that may work under you to support you in your training endeavors and goals mm-hmm. and all that kind of stuff. But ultimately, if you weren't there, the knowledge hasn't been effectively passed down, whether because you don't understand it well enough to teach it, or you just haven't gone through the process of doing so, where if you were to walk away from that, like there's no way it would sustain the same level of um, you know, service that you were able to provide when you were there, right? So the fact that you yeah. were able to educate yeah, yeah. effectively down uh, the ladder and understand the business well enough to be able to make it, be able to operate that well, I think is uh, something that a lot of people can learn a lot of things from. Um, yeah, and it's not even just like the knowledge, like the actual dog training knowledge, yeah. but actually like just structuring the business in such a way that you're um, sort of liberated a little bit from it. I yeah. think a, a lot of dog trainers, they become um, like they're working for their business instead of their business working for them. Yeah. And that becomes an issue. And I always tell people like whether or not you ever intend on, you know, like kind of like selling your business, right. But like getting it to the point where it can operate in that kind of way should be everybody's goal. Mm-hmm. If you're growing beyond just being like a, like a one person operation or like a two person operation, which by the way, like two, um, Oh, whoops. Hold on one second. My, uh, my earpiece is giving me a lot of issues. So I think it just changed. Let me just I'm, I'm, give me one second. I want to grab my other one. Let's see if my audio comes back. Can you guys hear me or no? Yeah. I mean, yeah, it yeah. actually sounds pretty good how it sounds right now. Okay. So, uh, you know, if you want to get there that going, go. that's fine. But yeah. Yeah. Let me see if these, this might yeah. die again. Um, it's my beats have been now. giving me yeah. issues, man. Yeah. Beats have been giving me issues. Like said, I had charge. It said I had like 60% and then just died on me. <laughs> Apple products, you know. <laughs> It's Dr. Dre, man. Don't blame Apple. <laughs> Apple blame Dr. Out, Dre. Um, yeah, yeah. So if that so, drops out, though, I'll just use the regular audio. It'll be fine. No, you're fine. Um, yeah. So I, yeah, like you were saying, I, I um, you know, whether you intend to sell it or not, obviously, it's important to be aware of those types of things to give yourself, like you were saying, a little bit more relief from that day to day grind. Because one of the biggest things we see in dog yeah. training, obviously, is young trainers just working a gazillion hours a week and just completely burning themselves out because you can't escape it, especially when you have dogs in your care 24 hours a day, you know? Yeah. I think burnout rates are widely underreported in this industry. Um, and I, I mean, like when I get contact forms in for my coaching, um, like burnout is like top of the list (laughs) as far as like some of the common things that people, cause I always ask people like list their goals and like dealing with burnout is pretty high on there. Obviously there are some other things that are high on there too, but uh, that's definitely one of them. So helping people kind of structure their businesses in such a way that it's not so burdensome, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Because that's kind of what it's become for a lot of people. It becomes like a little bit of a burden, which is unfortunate. Yeah. You know, where, where do you find the best? So I don't know, you know, how much you stay current on the, you know, dog trainer gossip drama just in the industry, like around social media and everything like that. But where do you find the balance with there's been a big talk lately amongst, you know, a handful of different dog trainers of like, you know, there's a lot of people that are doing business coaching right now and, you know, teaching Mm -hmm. people how to run their businesses more efficiently and ultimately, you know, obviously make more money, right. And do things like that. Um, and there's a lot of talk of like, you know, the attention shouldn't be on that. It should be on training the dogs where my mentality on that is like, I, I understand the, the point behind it, right? Like obviously your number one attention shouldn't be like, let's just make more money. But it's like, if we could reduce burnout rates, right. And we could have people operate their businesses more efficiently and be more, uh, you know, have more attention to detail and stuff like that. We're going to provide a better product, right? A lot of the issues that we're seeing within the industry are going to decrease because you're going to have more of a mental capacity to pay attention to those things, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there definitely is a balance there. I think that's a good word to use because there are, 
I mean, let's face it, there are trainers out there. I think we all have seen some yeah. of the trainers out there that really focus on, um, like heavily on, um, yeah. income, especially like some, not all, but some of the franchises yeah. that are out there are like really income focused. Right. Sure. And we see some really terrible dog training come out of some of these sources. Yeah. Like, like God awful dog training. Mm -hmm. Um, but the reality is like dog training is a hard career. It's not an easy business to be in. I mean, any type of entrepreneurship is challenging and dog training itself poses some additional, very unique challenges as well. And at the end of the day, like if you're not earning a good enough living doing it, then like why freaking bother? Like, why would you put yourself through that? Um, because if you just love training dogs, then like, okay, get a different job that pays really well and then join a, like a dog sport club and, and train dogs, but, um, or train dogs like on the side, but this is, it's a tough gig to, to make it your full-time job. Like in the beginning, you probably are going to work a lot of hours. And so there has to be some good return on that. Otherwise, like realistically, why do it? And, um, especially, especially then I get a lot of people where, you know, they're operating out of their homes and then that becomes a tax on their family. And so they want to be able to expand into a facility. And as you know, I mean, you've, you've started and grown uh, multiple, you know, locations and facilities. So I think, you know, this as well as anybody, including myself, um, like running a facility comes with then an even greater set of challenges. And again, it's like, if you're not going to bring home a decent income at the end of that, like, why would you put yourself through it? Like, because now you're not only like training dogs and dealing with all the emotional sort of baggage that can come along with that, especially when, when you're working with the families and, and their stress and you're taking that on. I mean, a lot of dog trainers tend to be empaths in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. Um, you're dealing with the stresses of entrepreneurship and the ups and downs and the roller coaster ride that can go with that. But then you're also like, there's no way you're going to like really run a facility and not run yourself into the ground without having like at least... I would say three to four employees. And so now on top of all that, you're throwing on being a manager and also like an HR rep and d- d- all those kinds of things that go along with that and all that added stress. So again, it's like, if you're going to do all of that, and I've come across trainers that are like, they're starting their facility and they're like bringing home like $40,000 a year. And yeah. it's like, if they didn't have a spouse that was like paying the bulk of their family bill, like there's just no way that that would even sustain them. Yeah. And so again, like why would you put yourself through that? Mm-hmm. So I think there does have to be a balance because I mean like any, any like, you know, of these like self, like I'm not into like self-help stuff. Like it's just not my, my cup of tea, but any of these like kind of like self-help type people will tell you like, you can't take care of other people unless you take care of yourself. Yeah. You know what I mean? So if you're burning yourself out, you can barely afford like a decent car and I'm not talking about driving a Mercedes. I'm just talking about like not driving a jalopy. Um, you know, you're worried about your month to month bills. Um, like it's going to be hard for you to bring your best self to your clients. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I, I think, yeah, it's absolutely a balance. And so I think that's where, um, and again, like not to toot my own horn, but I think there are very few people out there. Um, I'm not going to say I'm the only one by any stretch, but I think there are very few people out there that have both the, sort of, um, respect when it comes to, uh, the actual training and behavior, knowledge and technique, as well as the business skills and bring those two things together. Um, because a lot of times what we're seeing are like one or the other, there are some like amazing trainers out there, but like they can't run their businesses worth a damn. And then there are some really good business people out there, but their training leaves a lot to be desired. And there's like a small handful of us that are kind of doing both. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, I think, I think both are super important at, at the end of the day, you know, both are super important. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Um, so, uh, kind of how I wanted to structure today, like I was, I was telling you is I really want to look at, you know, in, and I wrote just a, a, just a brain vomited like list here of just different types of issues and stuff. I feel like that I either see or have experienced or anything like that. I think, you know, one thing that there's this guy Josh and I are, are into, and he, he had this post recently where he was talking about, you know, when you're looking at, you know, growing your business or fixing your business or anything like that, you want to look at 
basically what are all the things that could put you out of business potentially? What are some of the biggest mm. crises you face and essentially like reverse yeah. engineer them and look at, you know, what are some tactical solutions for those types of things? How do we address those things? How do we stop those things from happening in the first place? Mm. So I want to kind of look at some of those types of things and, uh, you know, really just kind of start rolling through um, different types of solutions for for day to day issues that people are having. So um, before I get into mine, what now? Obviously, you said burnout rate. Obviously, that's one of the number one mm-hmm. things that you see, right? And in a lot of cases, we'll see it when people are doing it in the home. There's a there's a trainer that I'm I'm pretty good friends with down in North Carolina that you know he's been doing the in home thing for a while. And one of the biggest things he was telling me is like, man, like I I'll, I'll train dogs for like three months, four months, and then I need to take like two months off, right? And I just go and yeah. just like do something else. And he's kind of figured out his science for it. But there's a lot of people that just have 24 hour care of dogs, seven days a week, like 365 days a year. Right. Yeah. Outside, if you're doing board and train out of your house, it's, like it's crazy. It's you tough. need to schedule some yeah. periods where you don't have dogs in your house or you're going to, you're going to drive yourself insane. Yeah. yeah. So, so, and if you have a spouse, like you, you run the risk of your spouse, like leaving you, <laughs> it's, it's not fun. My, you know what I mean? Yeah. My Especially wife your spouse is not a dog trainer. Do yeah. hundred you know? percent. So, so I know one of, so what, Obviously, like as we're looking at these types of things, right, I think a lot of this kind of stuff that I've noticed just in, you know, again, I've been training now for myself for coming up on like eight years or so. And Mm -hmm. from eight years ago to now, one of the number one things I see is just how many more and this could be because social media and we're seeing it now. I'm interested to hear your opinion on this, but it feels like there's just so many more dog trainers than there were like five years ago, six years ago, seven years ago. And I don't know, you know, where that's stemming from as far as like when I was first getting into this, as I was looking around at other facilities and stuff, it seemed like the way people got into training was like, you know, there's a facility, there's somebody that's been training dogs for a long time. And then you go and work there, right? And you learn under that person, you get a set of skills and a set of knowledge. And then if you want to branch out on your own and start your own thing, you do that. But you kind of work through this process of like, I don't want to call it paying your dues, but like learning under some sort of guidance, right? And I think, Yes, right now, yes. because of social media, because of a lot of the people out there, like you're mentioning, that are talking about, oh, well, you could get into dog training and, you know, within a year be making six figures and doing this and doing that. I think a lot of people are kind of skipping that step, jumping into it, and they may have a good knowledge of working with their dog. They may understand concepts and stuff like that. But the only true guidance that they have at that point is coming from essentially a YouTube. Yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. Right, right. So they'll have like a, a mentor through, like, okay, I watch this person's videos, I watch this person's content, and I learn the solutions that I need by watching those videos or by like yeah. a quick back and forth interaction in the comment section with somebody. And I find that there's just there's just this huge disconnect of understanding the why behind the things that they're doing, which is running into so many further problems. Right. I think that's absolutely. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, 100%. So I think, you know, to your kind of first point there about like there being just like way more dog trainers. I mean, I think part of that honestly was, um, you know, COVID, yeah. right? Um, that shift in the workforce has been huge and people wanting to kind of branch out on their own. And the thing about dog training is it's a, it's a business that you can get started in with very little upfront cost and very little overhead. Mm-hmm. So it's a low risk, like entrepreneurial venture. You can just sort of like put your Facebook page out there and build a little website on Squarespace for 150 bucks. And, yeah. you know, off you go, you're a dog trainer. It doesn't really take a lot up front to be able to do it. And so I think that's, that's kind of part of it. I, I know I've had a lot of people reach out to me since COVID saying like, Hey, like I recently left my career of, you know, being blah, blah, blah. And I want to get into dog training, you know, where should I begin? Um, so I think that that's part of it. Um, and that was kind of always one of the things that was alluring about this business is that, you know, you can work for yourself without, without like a major risk. Right. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, again, kind of like the thing I said earlier, like, I think there are some gaping holes in even like formal dog training education. So I think even some people, they go to some of the major schools that are out there that are, you know, anywhere from three weeks to three months and sometimes even a little bit longer. Um, and they think they're going to come out of that and like, they're going to be really, really prepared for everything that's going to come at them in the, in the world of professional dog training. And no doubt, like, like some of the schools do give a really nice foundation, but it's just that it's a foundation. Mm -hmm. And, um, it's kind of like any other career, right? Um, like, you know, 
if you come out of law school, like you're not going to like instantly like start your own law practice, right? Like you're going to be an associate under another attorney for a while, develop a skill set, kind of find your niche and then eventually maybe become a partner and then eventually maybe develop your own practice. Yeah. Um, but a lot of people are just going to these schools and they're thinking that like, they're kind of like going to come out of that and, and sort of be able to just do it all. Yeah. Um, and obviously so, some people are going to be, you know, obviously more uh, like adept to it just naturally than others. Some people, I mean, I've seen people that learn and develop incredible skills just from watching YouTube videos. Like yeah. some people are, are that kind of learner and they're going to just get their hands on dogs and practice. Um, but, um, but yeah, I mean, it, definitely there are a lot of dog trainers now. Yeah. I think there are just a lot of people trying to find alternative sources of income now. And I think that's a huge part yeah. of it. Um, just people are looking to change careers. People are looking for alternative career paths. We are in a changing world. This economy is unlike any economy that we've seen in, in 20 years. I mean, it's even very, I mean, I, I grew my business in the middle of the Great Recession you know, 2008, like I, I started my business in 2007, mm -hmm. right? So my business was like, I was just pushing it to full time around 2008 and then growing it throughout 2008, 9, 10. I purchased my training facility. I purchased the building at the end of 2010 and was developing it in 2011. And so it was all during that period. And that economy was very different even than what we're seeing today. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's just, there's, there's so many factors, right? There's so many factors that kind of go into this yeah. sort of thing. So so how do you, I'm interested in how you answer that question of, you know, how do I get into it? Because I get a lot of people that reach out to me as well, whether it's, I've had some past clients that, you know, a year and a half later, same deal, reach out to me, you know, I really loved dog training. I'd really love to get into it. Where do I start? This, that. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's interesting because from the personal standpoint, like I got into it again through working for somebody and learning that way. But once I separated and was off on my own, like I made a lot of mistakes along the way. And that's why I seek out people like you or, or, you know, other mentors and stuff that I had to help me learn from those mistakes and grow from them ultimately. But it, it just, because it feels like there's so many of them right now, the other downfall and thing that I see happening is just, and I'm sure this happened before, right? But I see even more owners going to trainers with dogs that are challenging, they need help with, stuff like that, and they're just spending so much money with so many people that don't know how to solve these problems, and by the yeah. time they get to somebody that is experienced and working through these things, even though, you know, obviously we're on a higher price point than a lot of people, they've already spent double that on other trainers and they kind of give yeah. up some hope and it's like well what's the difference you know like why would i then hit a point where it's like now i'm spending seven thousand dollars in total over the course of all these different training companies to get results right so so yeah. how do we answer that question and help people get into dog training that don't have that much experience while avoiding a lot of that right a lot of the unethical stuff that comes along the way of taking money when you're not necessarily in a position to be able to help yeah. Yeah. So I think, um, you know, you and I got started similarly. I mean, I started out like I never went to like a formal dog training school. I started out apprenticing under somebody, which, yeah. you know, in my opinion, apprenticing means you're working for free. Sure. Um, in fact, like old school, like medieval times, you paid <laughs> to be able to apprentice. Right. Yeah. Um, some people call their their like shadow program type things like an apprenticeship program. And that's fine. Like, I'm not knocking that. But yeah. like when I say apprentice, basically like I went and I worked for free yeah. so that I could learn this skill set. And even myself, like I dove into my own business way earlier than I probably should have. And I talk openly about yeah. that. I mean, I, I had, I really had no business opening my own business at the time that I did, yeah. but also to, to be fair, like I tried to find other trainers to work with. And, um, I think the dog training community is a little bit more open these days, but yeah. you know, kind of back in the day, like people were pretty closed off and weren't really willing to, take on new people also just like dog training jobs are sort of few and far between. Yeah. Um, but what happened was, um, I was offered a job at the place I was apprenticing, but my wife was, uh, was going to be going to law school. And so we already knew we were going to be moving. So we moved to a new city. I reached out to trainers in that new city and like, I just could not get a foot in the door with anybody. So I said, screw it and sort of did my own thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, and like paid a price for that. Like, sure. uh, like I have scars, on my body from taking bites. And the majority of those are from those early years because I was mm -hmm. taking on these dogs that I should have taken out. But also to my credit, I was not charging nearly what I see some new trainers charging today. Yeah. Yeah. And 
kind of to jump to one of your later points there where it's like, yeah, like they finally make it to somebody like yourself and yeah, the price point might be higher, but like they can get the knowledge they need. But the, the, the sad truth is a lot of times the price point isn't that much higher. Yeah. We're actually seeing people with only a couple of years experience charging as much yeah. as people with 10 years experience. And, and then there's, there's sort of a cap, right? Like you can only charge so much for this. Like people can only afford yeah. to pay so much. Um, and it's, it's, I mean, especially now with the economy, the way it is. Um, and so that can be a little bit frustrating, I think for a lot of more experienced trainers where they're like, man, like, you know, Joe Schmo down the road, like this dude just started and he's charging the yeah. same amount that I'm charging, you know, mm -hmm. certainly that was frustrating to me at times. Mm -hmm. Um, so my recommendations for people who want to get started dog training, there's a couple of ways to do it. I mean, one, like help out a rescue. Like if you just want to get your hands on dogs, like help out a rescue, like start walking dogs to a certain, a certain point, like you just need a certain amount of time with your boots on the ground and your hands on a leash. Um, honestly, like working in a daycare and managing groups of dogs is an amazing education yeah. in dog communication and dog behavior. Some of the best trainers that I've worked with have started out in daycares, also started out as dog walkers. Yeah. So even though these are like not as glamorous jobs, they're going to give you really valuable experience, but it takes time and you have to be willing to do that less than an ideal job for a while. Yeah. Um, you know, if it's, if it's feasible in your area, find a trainer whose style you kind of like, and like literally take every program they offer, yeah. go through private lessons with them, take any group classes they offer, like just put like, again, yeah. you pay for your education, right? So you put your dog through, be consistent, be disciplined with your dog, yep. that trainer is going to take note and at some point express to them that you're interested yep. and offer to help out around their facility. Mm -hmm. Again, offer just to come in and clean some kennels, you know, at the end of the day or on the weekends. Some of my early staff, like that's what they did. You know, one of these guys who used to work for me, his name was Adam. I think you met Adam a few oh, yeah. times when you were at my facility. Sorry, let me tell my dog to be quiet. He hears the trucks outside. My old dogs are going senile, so they just mm -hmm. bark at random things. Come on, Charlie. Um, you know, when Adam wanted to work for me, I didn't have a position available, but he had a job he was working where he worked like the seven to three shift. And that dude literally came in every day at three 30 yep. for no pay and just like hung around. Yep. And if I had something I needed him to do, he was there to do it. But otherwise he just hung around, but because he was a client first and he showed that commitment and he expressed the interest, I, I didn't mind being there because I, because we had a relationship. If he was just a random dude off the street that said, Hey, can I just, can I just like show up every day? And if you have work to do, I'll do it for free. I would have said no. Cause it's like, I don't, I don't know you. Like we don't, but because he was a client, I said yes. Yeah. And then when the time came, cause my business was growing that I needed help. It was like, why bother putting out an ad? Like I've got this dude right here. Who's already sh demonstrated every quality that I would want in an employee, yeah. you know, and he kind of already knows the ropes of my business. So that's a really great way to get started. And then if you don't have that availability, um, then yeah, like there are some good dog trainer schools out there. You do have to be willing to like travel and spend some time away from your family or away from your home. Um, but I think the expectation should be like, go to that school and then come out and then continue to gain more experience. Like, yeah. you know, again, then apply to help out another dog trainer and you can have on your resume that I went to this school. And I'm looking to gain more experience. I had a, a several really, really great employees that we actually like relocated from out of town who didn't have a ton of like real world experience, but one of them came out of Star Mark Academy yep. and had a really great foundation that then we were able to add in the nuances on top of. And one of them came out of Tom Rose School. Yep. And both of them were able to really hit the ground running for us. And, you know, if either one of them wanted to just work for me for a couple of years and then branch out on their own, they would have been able to do that. Yeah. And I think that's like a, a way like kind of safer and more realistic way to go about this, where you're going to get that sort of experience that you want. But again, part of it's also like, if you're going to work for another dog trainer, you kind of want to make sure it's a trainer who, who you respect Yeah. because, um, like not to be, not to be, you know, sort of a downer, but there are a lot of shitty dog trainers out there. Like they're just really hard. I think um, that's kind of the point of all of this. <laughs> yeah. 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 You know, yeah. um, and, and by shitty, I mean, like everybody has room to improve. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm always learning and trying to improve my own skills. I'm, I'm by no means yeah. perfect. 
And, um, so but there are, are there are dog trainers who like, that. yeah, who are like really far from perfect and like don't care. Yes. Mm-hmm. Like they're not even trying to grow. Yeah. And I think that's where it becomes a problem where, because then their employees come in and they have this like my way or the highway sort of attitude. Like yeah. this is the way we do it, period. Mm-hmm. And we're not really willing to like take in new information or change our protocols based on, you know, things that we're seeing or things that we're learning or seminars or online courses or anything else. Yeah. I I ask myself sometimes, you know, how much of some of the issues that I see people face are skill related versus mindset related. And what I mean by that is, you know, obviously, you know, I I always say I got extremely lucky how I got put into dog training because I got kind of put right in with dog sports and, you know, not just dog Mm -hmm. sports, but people that really knew what they were doing in the dog sport world. Right. And so my understanding. Yeah, you had some good mentors. I remember when you first came to me, I was really for somebody that had been training like for as short a time as you. I was really surprised at your your handling skills when we first met. That's why I kept inviting you to come back whenever you wanted. I was like, yeah, come on, because like. (laughs) It was like, like this dude's like this dude's got it. Like, you know, it was, you kind of had you already had some really good momentum going. Well, I appreciate that. But, you know, obviously, like I understood, you know, the science behind things, at least, you know, t- to as best as you can with that little experience. And I, I really pursued understanding again. I've, I've, I said a couple times already the why behind some of the things that I was doing. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, why mm-hmm. does a dog learn yeah. this way? Why do markers work in this way? You know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I know you've always really cared about those types of things as well. Right. I care a lot about that type of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's always what kind of separated you because you were in the pet dog world. But, you know, looking at the pet dog world still with this overarching mindset of some of the sport dog concepts and stuff, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, so, so obviously those skills are very important, you know, and it's something that when I'm working with like my trainers or my staff, uh, you know, or, or anything like that, I try to coach them through understanding some of those pieces better. But at the same time, I also see a lot of people that are in the sport dog world that transition to pet dogs that treat their pet dog clients like sport dog clients, right? And they kind Mm -hmm. of get a little too in the weeds and overcomplicated with things. And the mind, that's where you get to the mindset. The mindset isn't there of how, you know, what do I need to take? How can I take all of this knowledge I know and apply it to this individual in a way that is going to make them successful, right? Whether that means this person needs to understand the whys behind things and needs a more complicated approach and they're more active with their dog and stuff versus how can I take this information, make it like scientifically accurate still, but condense it into literally as fucking simple as I could possibly (laughs) make it. It, so that yeah. it just it, it causes them to just have less things to focus on but still do things right and get long-term success right i think it's yeah. like you know skill versus mindset are you seeing like a combination of the two are you seeing really the skill is lacking more or you, you know where's you know where would you say the biggest issue you're seeing from people from the training standpoint is yeah so i, I think um so it's a little bit of both. And I think that that idea of what you were just saying of like, hey, like I, I've got all this knowledge in my head and I want to impart it onto the client. And um, how do I do that in such a way that doesn't overwhelm them and that they can sort of focus on what's important? That is also a skill. Mm-hmm. And I think, again, that's one of those skills that you don't get in the dog trainer school necessarily. Yeah. Um, and like I have, you know, one of my clients I'm working with right now, this woman's got a tremendous amount of experience. She's a very skilled dog trainer, but what's happening with her and the reason she hired me is her lessons, which should be like an hour, maybe 90 minutes tops are like going for two to three hours. <laughs> yeah. Mm. And again, it's just, there's this overwhelming amount of information. It's like the clients are drinking from a fire, from a fire hose. And, um, you know, again, like, so, so helping her kind of take what, take all of this stuff that she's trying to impart. And and again, how do we, how do we narrow it down? Um, and then if there are other things, like how do we provide resources for our clients to make those other things accessible? But I think the other piece of that, um, to that's sort of related to what you're talking about here, especially coming out of like the sport dog world. Um, because you know, like a lot of my early mentors came out of the sport dog world as well. At that time, you know, we're talking, 15 plus years ago, um, there weren't that many pet dog seminars to attend. Like it just didn't, it wasn't a thing, right? There were a lot of sport dog seminars to attend. There were not pet dog seminars. And I always appreciated how sort of cognitive sport dog people were about their training. Like you said, they were focused on the why, like they could have a dog who's doing its competition healing and maybe the dog's forging ahead and they can have like four different techniques for how they might deal with it. But all of those techniques are going to have subtle 
differences in their outcome. Mm -hmm. And they go, well, based on this dog and exactly what's going on, which one of these techniques do I want to use instead of just like, you know, hit it with a sledgehammer kind of thing. Right. Mm -hmm. And I liked that idea of just like thinking a little bit more deeply about what we're doing. But I think what happens, and I see this a lot with people that are either, you know, again, transitioning from the sport world to the pet world, or a lot of, a lot of pet trainers right now are, um, more so than in the past are attending also like sport dog training, right? Like they're going to Michael Ellis school or they're going to Ivan Balabanov's programs. And I, I don't, I don't know exactly what's taught in Ivan's program. So I can't speak directly to that per se. Um, I have a t- tremendous amount of respect for him. Um, but you know, they're going to Bart's, you know, Bart Bellin's gold school. Bart was one of my yeah. early mentors mm-hmm. and, Again, like I'll use Bart as an example because I, I don't think he would disagree with anything that I'm going to say here. Um, you know, Bart is looking for a certain thing as an output from that dog, yeah. right? So when when Bart's training a dog, he's looking to create a lot of energy. In fact, he often likes to make dogs a little bit pushy, like almost a little bit dominant in a sense, um, and a lot like very high arousal, right? And so he does very specific things to create that. Yeah. And so then what I see is people kind of take that and go, wow, I learned all this great stuff in Bart's silver school. It's amazing. My mind's been blown, which is like truth. Like Bart's going <laughs> to blow your mind for yeah. sure. But then they try and like, you know, their, their client hires them and they're trying to train the client dog in the same way, yeah. not realizing like, okay, but what was the goal of what Bart was trying to do? Yeah. What's your goal or what should your goal be with this client's dog? And does that particular set of techniques serve this goal? Yeah. And as a perfect example of what I mean, and I always tell this story because it was one of those moments I spent a lot of time with Bart and this was before he had his like formal schools. And at one point it was the first time that he met um, my old dog Lobo, my Malinois and everybody else at this thing was a sport dog person, right? It was a five day sort of intensive thing. And there was only 10 of us attending. And so he first met my dog and he had me work my dog a little bit. And his comment to me was that my dog was too polite (laughs) and he didn't know me that well at this point. And, um, you know, he just assumed I was there for the same reasons as everybody else. And that my dog's function for me was the same as everybody else that I wanted to compete and I wanted him to perform the best here. And somebody else at the workshop knew my work and must have said something to him about like, Hey, like, just, you know, like Tyler's not like, he doesn't compete and his dog like helps him socializing other dogs and da 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 da. Yeah. And Bart came up to me the next day at lunch and he said, you know, I have to apologize to you. He said, your dog's not too polite. Your dog is perfect. Yeah. Because once he found out that I had a different set of goals for my dog, he recognized that what I was doing with my dog was like spot on for what my set of goals were. Another example of that would be, you know, Bart, again, his training techniques are designed to create these very high octane sort of dogs. And so he'll do things, for instance, um, or at least he used to, I don't know if he still teaches this, but like on his recall, he would time his reward marker when the dog was at its peak of intensity, where you know, this was like 10 years ago at that time, like everybody else you were seeing was like waiting for the dog to get to them and sort of finish. And yeah. then they would click or then they would say yes. Where Bart's going like he's clicking while that dog's like in full blast. And then just letting the dog like blast through his legs and come because he was trying to build that speed first and foremost. And you can juxtapose that with a very talented clicker trainer. Her name's Emily Larlam. Mm-hmm. Um, you can find her on YouTube under the handle Kiko Pup, K-I-K-O-P-U-P. Yep. I think she's one of the most talented clicker trainers around today. Um, and she, I've, I've had some really beautiful conversations with this woman and she focuses first and foremost on low arousal. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's like her top priority with her dogs. And it shows when you watch her dogs work, she can, she, you know, she can be teaching one dog a trick in the middle of the room using clicker and treats and her other dogs are in the background, just completely chilled out. Yeah. And they're not like in a place command or a down, like they're just relaxed. Mm-hmm. Right. And, what she's doing and what Bart's doing aren't um, contradictory yeah. to each other, right? It's the same underlying principle, that principle being that you can reinforce states of arousal with food. Yeah. But Bart is after one output and she's after a different output. And so they're using that same principle in, in sort of diametrically opposite ways. Yeah. And so that's the thing I think people have to be often careful of when it comes to like the why um, is, you know, understanding what function does this technique serve? 
what does my client really need? What should my goal be with this client right now? And let me make sure I'm using techniques that are serving that goal. Yeah. Um, and that's a, that's a huge focus of a lot of my work with my clients. We, we talk a lot about how to set very, very clearly defined goals. We want a clearly defined goal for the dog, but also clearly defined goals for our training sessions. And then understanding what is the goal of any technique that I'm using within that session yeah. and making sure that those things are all in alignment. And I often find that for many trainers, they're not like they, they haven't, they haven't sort of diagnosed their process in this way. And so what they're doing isn't in alignment yeah. with, you know, everything else. And so they they could be really good dog trainers. Um, their, their technique is good. Their knowledge is good, but their way of assessing not only the behavior problem, but assessing the process that they're going to take to address that problem is, is where yeah. they're sort of lacking. Mm -hmm. And we spend a lot of time on that. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's awesome. One other thing I would add that I tell people to, you know, get into when they're first starting in dog training or if they're like a junior dog trainer is don't get too hung up on like one school of thought with dog training. And this kind of goes, yeah. I'm going to tie this into kind of what you said there, which is like, I think one reason why, like you mentioned the sport dog, like people having three different solutions for that pushy heel or whatever it may be, that stems from understanding all of these different learning styles and teaching styles mm -hmm. that training, trainers have, right? We can get really hung yeah. up on sometimes, like this is the one way to do it. This person is doing it correct, right? As opposed to understanding the way that other people are doing it, right? Like force-free trainers. We like to shit on force-free <laughs> trainers as balanced trainers, like as a general community, right? But the things they're doing are not scientifically incorrect, right? They're all accurate. Accurate, and there's a reason for why they're doing all of those things. We could mm -hmm. argue, you know, if it's going to work or not or this or that, but those methods are very important to understand. And because, you know, that camp in particular has to focus so much on things like management and they have to focus so much on thresholds and all that kind of stuff. If you could take the best of that world and implement it into your training style, you're just going to have more tools at your disposal and you're going to be able to refine your skills even better. And then, um, where I was going with that is one thing that was kind of similar to that looking at it personally is when I first started having trainers that worked under me, I remember something I struggled with a lot, and I'm sure you've seen this as well yourself, is you do, you can kind of fall into that like, well, I've been doing it this way, right? And this way is working, so you have to do it in this way, right? And you train mm -hmm. them to be mini use, right? Yeah, and yeah. I think that's yeah. important with- It's a big problem. It's it's a problem. I think it's important a little bit initially with green trainers to teach them like, hey, this is yeah. one style. You know, this is one way that has worked, right? We have a track record of success with it. I want you to understand this. But from there, you have to at some point give that freedom to give their personal spin on it because our job as trainers is not to train a dog, not to train an owner necessarily. It's to teach an owner how to best live with their dog overall. And all we can do is pull from ourselves for that, right? I live a very different life with my dogs than my other trainer does, right? And that trainer lives a very different life with her dog than this trainer does, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And again, neither of them are incorrect. None of them are wrong. We just have to look at, again, like you were saying, what is this client looking to get out of it? What is their end goal? And what way do they need to live with their dog in order to most easily meet that end goal, right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think you know, again, like kind of circling back around to like, you know, just like all the available information that's out there today. Um, y yes, it's, it's really important to learn a variety of different styles. I mean, one of the things that I've, I've kind of always prided myself on is I don't really take a my way or the highway attitude to dog behavior. That's why when I started Consider the Dog, I didn't want to make it a membership site that was all about me and my yeah. training. I invited other dog trainers to contribute um, and so like, it's not uncommon that one of my instructors, I consider the dog will say something or do something that I don't personally like agree with. Like, I don't think it's the, the best approach, but like, it's not all about me and what I think. And as long as it's not unethical or something dangerous, yeah. you know, other people may find it really helpful. Um, and we are regularly promoting even like other people's work. Like I should probably be on like the paid advertising team for some of these other people's programs because, <laughs> Um, it's not uncommon in our Facebook group for, for, for myself and even other, you know, members or my moderators to actually suggest or promote other people's programs. Yeah. Um, and it's actually come up before where people have been like, Oh, like, you know, so-and-so, um, keeps mentioning this other dog trainer. Like, you know, um, I'm going to flag that comment or I'm going to report that comment because they shouldn't do that on this group. It's a paid <laughs> group. And I'm like, no, 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 no. 
Yeah. It, that's not what this group is all about. Um, but what happens is um, too early on, like you said, people get overwhelmed. Yeah. And so that's another common thing that I deal with. In fact, I have uh, two different clients right now that I'm working with who both are in that position where they're, they're somewhat self-taught, which a lot of dog trainers are. They've sought out mentors. They've gone to shadow programs and seminars and stuff, and they're getting information that's like a little bit conflicting or just different. And they don't know which technique is sort of best for them. Mm -hmm. And then they end up sort of getting analysis paralysis because of it. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, again, like when I was starting and maybe this was true when you were starting because like Facebook and YouTube weren't nearly as developed as they are now. Um, and seminars were a little bit fewer and further between. It was like, you would go to a workshop, you'd learn some new stuff, and then you'd have like six months to a year to like sit with that material yeah. and try it out and figure out w where it works for your style, where it doesn't sort of assimilate it into the whole. And then you might either go out and, and try something new or even just go to another one. Like I went to like three or four Bart Bellin workshops in a row mm -hmm. and kept getting deeper and deeper into his concepts each time. Um, nowadays people it's it, it is again like to use the same phrase it's like drinking from a fire hose they just have all this stuff coming at them yeah. and so yeah like when you're training a new employee in the beginning you want to say listen like just focus on this do it do it this way and get really good at this yeah but then you want to expose them to other things and then yes 100 percent, like you want to give them the freedom to be their own trainer yeah. um i deal with a lot of i get a lot of um business owners who come to me that are having issues with retention. Mm -hmm. And then I also get a lot of people that come to me that like, Hey, I used to work for another trainer and now I'm going on my own. And the reason why yeah. is because they always wanted it to be done this way. And like, I wanted to do it differently and I, I couldn't do it the way I would want to there, mm -hmm. you know? And so that becomes a big issue. And dog training is a personal thing. You've got to, you've got to find your own way about it. Even when I do my coaching, it's like, I don't want to turn people into clones of me. I want to help them be the best version of themselves. And, um, that, that might mean they're going to do things differently than me, but if they don't do it the way that feels good to them, they're never going to have that sense of ownership over their own work. Yeah. And they're never going to be doing the work to the best of their personal ability. Yeah. Yeah, you touched on an interesting thing there that I want to follow up on. So you said, you know, obviously employees, you know, staying with companies and, and wind up leaving them because they don't have their own kind of touch on things and business mm -hmm. owners struggling with retention and stuff like that. How do you approach, you know, if you had to look at, you know, somebody who's, you know, hiring new trainers and stuff like that and, you know, you know, obviously our number one goal is to reduce retention as much as possible, right? Or to increase retention as much as possible. Yeah. We don't want trainers yeah. to leave because it's very difficult yeah. to replace them, right? That's a skill that takes a long time to learn. If you have somebody good under your belt, you want to keep them around, obviously. Um, I think that because of social media and people talking about how much money you can make in the industry and this and that, I think some people really struggle with you know, as an employee, why would I not at some point branch out on my own and start my own company? And I think business yep. owners really struggle with how do I make this job so appealing that it becomes difficult for those people to leave? And how do you kind of guide people through that? If you have a business owner come to you saying, hey, I want to keep this person around long term, like how do I support that? And, you know, what things can I put in place in order to uh, to help reduce the chances of that happening? Yeah. So I think, I mean, part of it obviously is just going to come down to money. Yeah. Right. And so again, we talk about like, you know, the balance between developing skill and making money, like as a business owner, you have to be bringing in enough revenue mm -hmm. that you can pay a worthy enough salary to, to attract and retain good people, mm -hmm. right? At the end of the day, like money is a big factor. Yeah. Um, and uh, there's gonna be a wide range, of course, of what you might pay your employees based on their skill and experience. Um, I think giving people that sense of autonomy and ownership over that work is a really major factor. Sometimes that can matter more than money. Yeah. You know, just people's work. I mean, you know, I know several people like my wife included, my wife's an attorney and she left private practice to go into nonprofit work for a significant pay cut. Yeah. Um, but that was worth it for her. She was doing work that she cared about and it was a more family friendly environment as we were growing our family. Um, I know a lot of people that have no interest in starting their own business. They yeah. would prefer to work for somebody else. They don't want the headaches that go along with business ownership. Um, and then there are others that really are going to have that ambition to, you know, to kind of do their own thing. And, and sometimes you're, there's no, there's no stepping in front of that train. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like for some people like that's just the track that they're on. Mm -hmm. 
But um, I think if you want the best shot of retaining people, it's make sure you can pay them a reasonable salary, um, offer them benefits, but also, again, give them a sense of ownership over their work. I was just talking to one of my clients um, yesterday, and she's got an employee that's been very valuable to her. And right now, her business like solely does board and train, and her employee is really interested in doing private lessons and starting some group classes. Yeah. And um, the reason the business solely does board and train is because the business owner doesn't like doing private lessons. And I was like, you know, hey, if she wants to do this and, and you're cool with it happening, like, great. But like, let her develop the program. Basically, ask her because yeah. she's like, well, you know, what kind of group classes do you think we should start with? And I was like, well, ask her what type of group class is she most excited about starting? Yeah. And then, you know, basically ask her, like, you know, because um, like we discussed possibly, like, I could help her to develop those programs. But I said, but but don't just throw that at her. Like, don't say, hey, like, you want to start this class? Cool. I'm going to set you up with some sessions for yeah. to uh, get some help from Tyler and doing it. Ask her, say, hey, do you want to take a stab at developing this curriculum on your own? Yeah. Or um, if you want. I can set you up with a couple sessions with Tyler and he can work through it with you and help you develop the curriculum. Basically ask the employee what they want out of it and then just provide the resources for them to be able to do the things that they want to do yeah. and then give them the credit for it. Like let it be their class. You know what I mean? Don't, don't, um, don't make it like all about you all the time. Like make like this is so-and-so's class. Like when, you know, when those clients are happy, make sure that that credit is going to that employee. Yeah. Um, you know, even one thing that I see a lot that that causes a lot of, I think, um, lack of motivation for like assistant trainers is in board and train programs. A lot of times I, I, I encounter a lot of business owners where the, the business owner um, is the only one that's actually doing the client meetings. Yeah. Like they're the ones doing the go home sessions. They're the ones emailing the client. And having the conversations with the client and then the trainers are sort of behind the scenes doing the work yeah and while you may encounter here and there somebody who like just really prefers it that way like maybe you have somebody who's really great with dogs but has tremendous social anxiety or something like that and they don't want to be in front of the client but what what happens for most trainers is it really detaches them from the emotional impact that they're having on somebody's life yeah and again like this dog that this job is hard and it can be also very repetitive and um, can just sort of take its toll. And what sort of helps us get through that is these like beautiful moments that we provide for our clients where when we do that lesson and the client's just overjoyed and they can't believe how much better their dog is. Yeah. Um, or what attaches us to the quality of work we're doing is when we're the ones having those conversations with the clients before or during the board and train. Mm -hmm. And we're the ones hearing the pain that the client is feeling. And that motivates us to make sure we're doing a really good job for this person because they're suffering. Yeah. Right. And so when we don't connect the trainers to that work, I think I just lost my audio again, man. Can you guys still hear me? Yeah, yeah. It still sounds the same. Okay. It still sounds all right. All right. Um, then, um, you know, we're just detaching them from that. And, and again, it just becomes this monotonous thing they're doing. Yeah. So I really encourage people to develop their staff. And part of it is developing the staff, giving them, you know, the skills that they need to be like, you are the front person for this dog. Like you're going to train this dog yeah. and you're going to talk to the client and you're going to do the go home sessions. And you are responsible for making sure that this client and dog are sort of happy together yeah. um, and connecting that to the work, I think can make a massive difference. Um, but again, it gives that that ownership over it. Like I'm responsible for this. Like no one else is yeah. is telling me what to do. Like I've got to do a good job. I've got to do right by this person. This person is suffering. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. know. Yeah. That's why we're in it as pet dog trainers, right? Like we're in it to make people's lives better. Like yeah. that's that's really the payoff for us. Yeah. You know I mean, like like the money's nice, but like at the end of the day, you can make all the money in the world and still be friggin' miserable. Yeah. What carries you through and what gets you through sometimes the more challenging clients is those clients that like, they're just so overwhelmed with gratitude yeah. for the difference that you made in their life. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, I think additionally, one other problem we'll see with, uh, 
the the kind of when you have the owner that's doing you know the contacts you know they're doing the send homes they're doing the lessons all that kind of stuff and you have the trainers kind of in the background doing the work as we'll see a lot of cases that I'll have people reach out and they're like yeah I work for this training company it's like I'm training these dogs start to finish but it's like the owner is even if they're not like intentionally doing so it's seemingly like they're taking all of the credit for it as well oh yeah you know when those positive reviews come in it's going to be it's going to have the owner's yes. name on it because that's the only person going to say oh I worked with you know, David, yeah. and it was great. Yeah. And then like, you know, Josh is in the background, like, well, what the heck, man? Like I did all the heavy lifting on <laughs> yeah. that thing. Yeah. Um, so absolutely, absolutely. But, but, but then the flip side of that also is the owners start burning out because yeah. there's a, there's a mental load of like, when you have to keep track yeah. of the goals, especially some of these people that are, that are running like larger operations where they're taking in like six, eight, 10 board and trains. That's a lot to keep track of. Yeah. And then what we start to see is a lot of stuff fall through the cracks where they get to that final lesson and they haven't even had their hands on that dog very much. Yeah. And all of a sudden there's like the dog's not performing the way they would want them to. And that can be a very frustrating experience for the owner as yeah. well. So it's just a less than ideal sort of setup for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, you know, again, there are times when it can work, um, but you want to develop that trainer to the point where they can take take the lead on those cases and they can be doing it. Basically, if you want to retain a trainer, create the job so that it has all the things they would like about working for themselves and reduce the things they would not like about working for themselves. Yeah. Like, Hey, you don't have to do your own scheduling. Like, Hey, you don't have to do sales. You don't have to like sell the programs. Um, you don't have to deal with the money yeah. and like, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, but all the stuff that you would want to do, like you get to yeah. do that. And like, that's the trade off of like, yeah, sure. I could maybe make more money, like working for myself, but I'd also be like working way longer hours and I'd have all these other headaches that I don't have. And yeah. now I'm happy to work for somebody else because I get to just do the things that I love. And at the end of the day, I get to clock out and go home yeah. and I don't have all those worries over my head. I have a stable paycheck coming in mm -hmm. and, um, you know, I don't have all the liability on my shoulders. Yeah. Yeah. So, so on that, moving to kind of the next big topic here. Oh, that? I got something on this. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I've been, I've been David's media guy since the, you know, basically the beginning of Miracle, and it's it's been really cool to see, um, you know, he's got a couple of people that've been there pretty much since day one, and how you guys were talking about, you know, it's like the green trainer, like you come in, you kind of do my way, whatever, and then. As soon as he saw, you know, it's been maybe a couple of years now with a, with these trainers, and it's just like, okay, you have it. I want you to kind of take charge. I want I want to kind of see how you can mold yeah. your program, you know. And as soon yep. as he did that, explosion. I mean, the explosion of growth for these people, like. It, Absolutely. Yeah, it, it was, 100%. It's right? insane, you know, like. And it came for the company too. I mean, it was, yeah. it was funny. I still remember the first time I had somebody call, right. And I usually, I, I do a lot of sales calls and stuff, right. And I'm talking on the phone with somebody, you know, they know it's me. Right. And I'm like, all right, yeah, well we can get you scheduled with training. I was like, I have an opening this day or this day. And they're like, no, I want to work with Bridget. <laughs> they're like, no, yeah. I mm -hmm. want to work with Michelle or something like yeah. that. And I'm like, yeah. Okay. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. I think, and I, yeah, think, yeah. I think Bridget is a, a but like a happy tier mode. You know, it's yeah. like, it's like, that's what you're striving for. It's like, you want this to essentially for them feel like this is like you have your own business, but like you were there's, saying, you're not yeah. dealing with all the bullshit. You know what I mean? If yeah. there is a exactly, massive there's problem, a lot of bullshit. Yeah. If there's yeah. a massive <laughs> problem with something, like I am going to handle it. Like you don't have to stress yourself out with that so much. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Like, and I think it's yeah. cool. Uh, Bridget's a great example. Cause she's <laughs> like this little soft spoken, you know, lady and now she's just taking charge crushes it. Yeah. yeah she just crushes it you know and it's like she became like her own person you know mm -hmm. through this and and she's yep. just been able to take so much more responsibility and it's it's really cool to see that growth you know yeah. like you said like to give her that that feeling of all the, all that extra yeah. you know I don't know. <laughs> I think highlighting individuals yeah. on social media is so important too because so many dog training companies mm -hmm. can become just the face is Tyler. The face is David. And listen, like mm -hmm. obviously you need to have your spokesperson of the company that's preaching the good word of miracle canine training or consider <laughs> the dog or canine connection or any of those types of things. Mm -hmm. But you have to equally be able to showcase everything that's happening underneath that, you know? Yeah. And, and, and like, honestly, like you're going to, like you're, you're going to shoot yourself in the foot if you don't anyway. <laughs> uh, so like aside from like, 
again, like, um, like for those staff members, like showing them that like you appreciate their work and like, you're letting them get the credit for the work that they're doing. Mm -hmm. But also like, if you want to liberate yourself from the business where clients don't come in and like only want to work with you yeah. and only trust what you have to say and, and all these other things, like, then you've got to do that stuff. You, you have to create credibility for those. Yeah. And like, there goes, this, there goes, there goes, now let's switch again. I'm just like charging these alternatively now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you, you know, you have to, you have to give that credibility to those trainers and like, yes, a hundred percent, like you do run the risk of like you build that person's ego up and they go, well, I can just go on my own now. Like, of course you run that risk, yeah. but yeah. you learn a lot of risk by not doing it also, Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know? And some people are just going to leave. Like if they're going to leave, they're going to leave. And like, that's just the, yeah, I think that's a great point. That end of like, if they're going to leave, they're going to leave. And it's like, you could do everything in the world to like, try to like reduce the chances of that. And it's like, but like, yeah. So it's like the, the risk of not doing it and not letting them build their name for themselves. Right. Or being so stringent on like, you can only post these types of things. You got to post it from my page or any of those types of things. It's like, you know, all you're doing then is decreasing the value of that individual while they're with you, you know? Mm -hmm. So, yep. and I think that's Absolutely. those like big training companies, I think that's the big problem they have because it's like, you know, it's a corporate thing. So, it's you have to do everything like this and it's under our name, like only. I feel like a lot yeah. of those places do that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. 100%. Um, Okay, so so the thing I was going to ask, this is, and this one I think there's a lot of different directions we can go with it. What is your opinion on the current day board and train program, right? I feel like the board and train program has been something that's, it's been around since I've been training dogs and I've seen it do so many, so much of this, mm -hmm. right? Of like, it, it could be unbelievably beneficial in some cases and some of our best successes we've ever had have been in board and trains, but some of the biggest mm -hmm. issues that I see people face are with dogs that are in their care for board and trains. What is your opinion just on the current board and train climate? When you say like the big issues that people face, you mean like as the business owner, like some of those, the stresses that come into their business all, have to do with the board and train program? All of the, yeah, all of the above, right? So whether it's um, expectation setting and the dog goes home and we know a board and train doesn't fix problems and that owners are still going to see issues until they do some follow-up classes, whether mm -hmm. it's health related things that happen when the dog is in their care, whether it's um, you know, just the client can't handle the emotions of being detached for that long and, and, and they run mm -hmm. into issues from that, you know, like, I just feel like there's so many different problems that can arise within a board and train program. I'm just interested yeah. to hear your opinion on it as a whole and like the risk reward of that versus one-on-ones, which there's not quite, I mean, obviously you have the client either doing the work or not doing the work, but it's the same with the board and train in my opinion, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So I think, you know, obviously there's pros and cons to everything. And I, I work with trainers that, um, I think I, I have a client right now who only, I have two clients right now who only do board and trains. Yeah. Um, they don't offer anything else. You know, obviously there's one-on-one -on -one sessions as follow-up to the board and train, but like mm -hmm. every dog starts in a board and train. I also have clients, you know, one currently comes to mind that I'm working with right now also who only does one-on-one -on -one sessions, does not do board and trains, does not want to do board and trains. Mm -hmm. um, and there are pros and cons. I think, again, like if your goal is to scale your business ultimately and grow and bring on employees, I think board and trains um, are have a lot of advantages there. So I'll just put that out there from a business standpoint, from like a scalability standpoint. I think board and trains have a lot of advantages from a, like just what's best for the client standpoint. Um, again, like I like board and train programs. Yeah. Um, I think there is a lot of good we can do. I think we can make a lot of progress in board and trains that can sometimes be difficult to make in one-on-one -on -one sessions. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it really kind of boils down to how you're structuring it. Again, I think that yes, like expectation setting is, is important. Um, and like how you're selling the program, like what are you selling yeah. ultimately? You know, what kind of concept are you selling this person that they're going to get? Um, you know, because there are so many different ways you can structure it as far as like how you run your board and train, how much follow up you're doing, how much communication with the clients happening while the dog is in your care, mm -hmm. so on and so forth. Um, whereas like obviously private lessons, like, yeah, like there's significantly reduced liabilities with private lessons. Like at the end of the day, way less liability with private lessons. You don't have dogs in your care. Yeah. I mean, even your insurance will be less if you're only doing private lessons, right? Um, because of just reduced liability. But 
sometimes doing just private lessons can be frustrating, Mm -hmm. you know, because you are a little bit more beholden to the client's commitment and skill level. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think, you know, I I guess the short answer is I don't have like really strong feelings about it. Like I, I'm, I hope that's not like a disappointing answer for you. Um, like I don't have super strong feelings about it. You know, what I try and encourage for a lot of the trainers that I work with is we want to look at like their lifestyle and like what they need from their business yeah. and what kind of programs are going to, are going to work well for, for what they want their business to be doing for them and how they want to live their life. Yeah. Um, and sometimes that means adding more options. Sometimes that means taking away options yeah. that aren't really serving them well. And so, um, again, I know trainers that are very successful doing nothing but board and trains. And I know trainers that are very successful doing nothing but private lessons. And I know trainers that are very successful doing combinations of both. Mm-hmm. Personally, I like, and I think it benefits most people to have some um, tiers mm-hmm. of service available, right? Because board and train can be a, a sort of high cost of entry for a client. Yeah. And so I think if you're going to do board and trains, you know, again, if you're just a solo operation, maybe no big deal. But once you have employees or a facility and you have more expenditures that are not going to fluctuate with your um, revenue as much, mm-hmm. um, meaning like your mortgage is the same every month, regardless of how many clients you have coming in versus if you're a trainer who just operates out of your home and does private lessons, like your expenditures are like your gas yeah. and like training supplies. And if you're doing less training, those expenditures also are less, yeah. right? Um, and so once you have a, a, a larger business, right, employees who you want to make sure that like they're getting paid enough every week, even if you're slow, um, having multiple offerings at different price points helps to sort of smooth out the equity curve, so to speak. It's kind of like, you know, if you were to set up a retirement account with an advisor or just go on like Vanguard and set up like a target retirement account, they're going to put like some of your money in like U S equities, some of them in overseas equities, some of them in bonds and things like that. And like bonds aren't going to have the same return rate as like your equity positions, you know, your stock positions. But when your stocks drop a lot, like your bonds won't. Right. And that's the idea is like, it's there to smooth out the equity curve and you're going to be like, you might sacrifice a little bit, but it's gonna be less of a roller coaster for you. Yeah. Um, so I think that's sort of an important thing is to have those options for people where then as a business owner, you can help direct them. Sometimes you get a client where you're like, oh man, if I put this dog in board train, this person's going to be a huge pain in my ass. And like that happens, yeah. like you just know that like, that's not probably a good fit. Mm-hmm. Um, and other people where you're like, man, if I try and do private lessons with this person, like we're going to get nowhere. Like if they yeah. want a realistic shot at success, like I really, I've got to get this dog into a board and train. Yeah. Um, and so Again, just lots of pros and cons yeah. to both. Yeah, I think where that question kind of stemmed from is, you know, obviously over the course of the last year or two years, you know, we've been seeing so much pop up as far as like you were saying, like horrible things happening within companies, right? Mm-hmm. And in addition to just horrible things happening within companies and just sheer like neglect, abuse, things like that, um, I think that there's a lot of little things that we'll see pop up from time to time of like, you know, a, a, a good trainer that, you know, has no ill intentions on dogs and you know, whatever, when the dog is there, the dog develops a skin issue to something or this or that. Right. And, you know, no matter what, right. Like obviously nine out of 10 times, like you've experienced situations like that. I've I've experienced situations like that. Nine out of 10 times, if you have a good relationship with your client, it's not going to be a big deal. You talk to them about it, keep the communication open. But in the end of the day, right, you're going to run into people that are just unreasonable with those types of things. Right. And then you get into 99% of the things you see that get reposted on social media and trainers reputations getting ruined and stuff like that comes down to things that typically, at least from my viewpoint, are happening within board and train programs. And I see so many people. 100%. Yeah. Definitely like some of the bigger stressors that we would have as far as like unhappy clients, it comes out of board train. And and that's for a variety of reasons. I mean, some of it is things are happening with their dog that's outside of their site. And so there's that little bit of like trust of like what's really happening behind the scenes there. Um, So I think there's there's two things I want to kind of say about that. Um, Because those issues should be really few and far between. Of course. And again, board and train can bring in a lot of revenue and be a very scalable program to like, you can have trainers come in, just assist with pieces of the board and train initially, and then gradually take on more and more responsibility with it. And that's hard to do with private lessons. Mm -hmm. Um, So one is like, you want to have as much communication and transparency 
with the owners as possible. Yeah. You notice something going on with the dog, you want to make the owners aware of that as soon as possible. You should be regularly like checking over the dogs, looking for, you know, again, like look at the paws. Are they licking their paws a lot when they're in their kennels? Yeah. You know, are you getting sore spots on the neck from the training collars? Like, you want to be super aware of that stuff and you want to be transparent and you want to bring the owners in on the dialogue with it. You don't want to try and resolve it on your own and like, yeah. you know, whatever, right? If you notice the dog's not eating a lot, like tell the owners, Ask the owner if they have a preference of how you would handle that. Yeah. Do they want to try to bring it? Some owners would be like, you know, I've got this, this, um, sometimes I put chicken broth on top of their food. I'll drop some off for you or, you know, whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and then they don't come in and go like, oh my God, my dog lost weight. What's going on? Because they know that you were aware of that problem and you were trying to resolve it and you were bringing them in yeah. on the resolution and, and they were part of that decision-making, right? It's a lot harder for them to be upset when like, they were part of the decision-making process of how we handled these things. Yeah. Um, but the other thing is at the end of the day, uh, one thing that everybody sort of behaves the same way with is money. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons that you get these big unhappy customer things with board and trains is because it's the highest price point ticket, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when somebody drops $4,000 on training and their dog gets a little sore spot on their neck, they get really pissed off versus if they dropped like $600 on training, right? Mm -hmm. And again, if, you, if you're if you running your business well, these issues should be really few and far between. Mm -hmm. And then when they do and you get that customer and they're just over the moon upset, like literally just give them their money. Yeah. Like offer them half their money back, offer them all their money back. Yeah. At the end of the year, like you won't even remember difference. that yeah. that bit of money if you're running your business well mm -hmm. again and, and running your business well again you have to be making enough money like you have to have a cushion in the bank you yeah. have to be able to absorb these things it's the cost of doing business yeah right and it shouldn't be happening to, if, if this is happening 10 times in a year then like yeah. you've got issues in your facility that you need to address yeah you know what i mean um if, but if it happens once a year or once every other year which is like probably realistically where it should be for for most people um, and every now and then you have to give somebody like $2,000 back, like you refund half their boring trip. Like, trust me, those people that are really upset, they get become a lot less upset when you give them some money. Yeah. <laughs> like it's, <laughs> it's really sad to say it, but money is emotional for people. Yeah. Money is, there's a, there's a whole psychology of money is a thing. Mm -hmm. Right. Money is emotional for people. And so, and that's something I learned from my mom. My mom's an entrepreneur as well. Um, and you know, she is, she, she'll, she'll fire a client like that. If they're causing her a lot of stress, she'll yeah. like, she'll eat the loss and just get rid of the client because it's just not worth it at yeah. the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And once you give somebody their money back, like they don't leave that negative review. They don't blast you on social media. They don't do that yeah. stuff. Yeah. You know, like, and like, I'm not advocating like paying somebody off. Yeah, like sure. obviously yeah. if you like legitimately effed up, like that's on you, <clears throat> but some of these things just happen, right? Like yeah. you get like, like for instance, dogs losing weight in board and train. Like yeah. it happens all the time. Yeah. Half of it's because they're getting more activity and half of those dogs were overweight to start with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, but the owner gets upset because their dog lost five pounds in your board and train, but you're like, yeah, but like they're eating less because we're managing their food intake because we're feeding them during training. They're yeah. exercising a heck of a lot more. And for a lot of dogs, when they come in for those first few days of, of any kind of boarding, a lot of dogs don't eat as much for the first two, three days. Yeah. Um, and that stuff can just happen. Um, but again, like, you know, you shouldn't really that frequently be having like big upsets yep. with customers. Like it just shouldn't, it just shouldn't happen. And if it is happening frequently, then we, then, then we have to dig into that and say, yep. what systems do we need to put in place to prevent these things yep. from happening? So, you know, so to me, it's a trade off. Like, yeah, yeah, there are bigger stressors with board and train, but there's also bigger <laughs> potential payoffs with board and train yep. as well. No, that makes, that makes a ton of sense. So looking at, right. So if, you know, because again, like like you mentioned, right? Like weight loss, licking paws is another big one. And I think a lot of people in board and train see with dogs. They do huge, yeah. You get those hot spots and irritation, demo, whatever right it's there. called. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. So, what sorts of things when you were operating? Because like you would do a decent amount of board and trains, obviously. What sorts lot, of things yeah. would you put in place to try to reduce the chances of all those things happening? So again, the biggest thing is client communication. Yeah. Right. Like if a dog didn't eat a lot its first two, three days. Like we're going to tell that to the client. Yeah. Like we're just going to let them know and we're going to let them know it's normal. And we're going to let them know, you know, exactly what we're doing about it and, and how we're handling it. We're just going to keep them in the loop with what's going on with their dog. Yeah. Um, so that's a, that's a huge thing, right? Like I think that's kind of the biggest one is just open client communication. Don't try to like hide these things yeah. and fix it and then hope that it's better when the client picks up. Mm -hmm. You want the client to be prepared 
Yeah. yeah and, and this comes down to everything with your board and train. Like, let's say, um, for instance, you have a dog, you're doing a three week board and train. That's a really common length of time, maybe four week. And you know that like the dog's weak point is like, um, like getting into a down, like, you know, that sometimes you have to give that extra little bit of leash guidance. It doesn't just always go verbally yeah. every single time. Right. <clears throat> well, like if you know that, then like tell the owner that yeah. before they come in for their lesson, like, why like let them downing? know yeah. that like <laughs> that's your dog's weakness. So that when you do the lesson and you say down and the dog doesn't do it, the owner's like, Oh yeah, it's exactly what you said was going to happen. Like, yeah. you know, my dog really well, yes. you know, instead of like the owner's expecting everything to be like this. Mm -hmm. And then there are some things that just aren't quite like, um, and so kind of same thing, like, you know, if you see that little sore spot, the dog's licking their paws, like yeah. just say something to the owner when you're checking in with them. Um, that's kind of the biggest thing. Obviously you want to be running an environment where like if every dog that's coming into your kennel is like getting those licked hot spots, then yeah. like, there's probably like, it shouldn't be that common. Like yeah. it happens a lot, but it shouldn't be like every single dog. Yeah. Um, you know, the weight loss should be negligible if dogs are losing weight. Like it should not be that noticeable for most dogs unless you're putting them on a scale and you, and you see that like they lost X, Y, and Z, but it shouldn't be like a visible weight loss in most yeah. cases, unless that dog was obese yeah. and the owner was free feeding and things like that, in which case the weight loss is a good thing. Yeah. Um, you know, sore spots on the dog's neck from training collars, yeah. right? Like, are you leaving your collars on too much when the dogs are in their kennels? Are you checking their necks regularly for those things? Because if they, you see the sore spot and it's there and the owner knows you're aware of it, the owner knows you're tech, taking steps to mitigate it. Then when they come in for their lesson and they see the sore spot, it's, they're not shocked by it. Yeah. You don't want there to be any surprises for the owner when they pick their dog up. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like they're picking their dog up there. It should be like a happy moment. They should, they should know exactly what they're walking into and, and what to expect. So I think that's kind of the big yeah. thing. And again, if you're like, like bogging yourself down with so many dogs that it's like a factory, like dog after dog after dog, that you're not able to take the time to like yeah. give the dog a once over and make sure that, um, you know, it's, it's happy and healthy and everything else mm -hmm. then, you know, cause we see it even like, um, you know, we do a lot of aggression work. And we would see it a lot with muzzles, like on the bridge of the nose, mm -hmm. you know, yep. again, we just tell the owners like, Hey, like got these little sore spots doing, like we're trying to use the muzzle minimally because of that. We're also wrapping it with some athletic tape to try and add some padding to it. We just want to make you aware. Yep. We're also going to put a little bit of Vaseline on it. Hopefully that helps it heal up a little bit, but you know, obviously the muzzle is sort of a necessary evil right now. We just don't want you to be like alarmed. If you see that little bit of a scab on your dog's nose, that's what it's from. Yeah. But if the owner comes in for their lesson and they didn't know that was there and they see it, they go, what happened to his nose? Yeah. And now they have this negative emotion right off the bat. And now you have to kind of come back from that. Yeah. You know what I mean? I remember you so told clear expectations, clear transparency. That's really the name of the game. Yeah. No, I, I would totally agree with that. And that, that's how we've mitigated. Like, obviously anybody, if you've been doing this long enough, you've experienced one of many of those issues. You know what I mean? But somehow, yeah. somehow over the course of eight years or so, knock on wood, right? We've yet to run into a situation where it's become a serious problem because we keep the communication open yeah. with people. And it's funny. I remember, exactly. I remember exactly. one time when I was at your facility, we were talking about something stupid, like, like you were getting right, you're building out like your grooming area or something like that. And we were talking about bathing dogs before they go home from board and train programs. And you, you had mentioned, you're like, yeah, it's like, it's like a part of the experience, right? Like you want it to be this happy moment and you get there and it's like, not only is my dog well behaved, but like, oh my God, they smell really good too. And it's like, you know, all of those different things just add up as far as the care. Cause that's another thing. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, you figure you're, these dogs get fucking filthy when they're at the training facility. You know what I mean? They're running yeah, and they, playing. They smell and gross rolling, by like, the time they're done. They're disgusting. You know what I mean? And like some people yeah. will send a home, a dog, right? Post board and train <laughs> like that. And it's like, why does my dog smell like piss? They must have pissed in their crate and this, that. It's like, no, they were literally just rolling around with dogs like 24 seven for the last three and a half weeks, four weeks. Right. Yeah. But it's an yeah. understandable thing that they would bring up at that point, you know? Yep. So yep. And you just build it into the program. Absolutely. Yeah. All those things. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So uh, follow up question to that. So kind of on the, the topic of like, how do we make board and train programs more, you know, I don't want to say ethical, but just, just more beneficial for the dog, more enriching for the dog, things like that. Common question will get asked when, 
uh, clients sign up for a board and train. How much time does my dog spend in the kennel, right? How do we balance out Mm -hmm. how many dogs we have at our facility versus how much time we could physically dedicate to them while still understanding Mm -hmm. they're in for training, but it's a board and train, meaning they are boarding while they're here, meaning they are going to be spending a fairly significant amount of time in the kennel while they're here as well. How do we balance that or answer that question? Well, I think, I mean, you know, the big thing is like, depending on, on what your program is designed to do and what you're, what you're selling people, right? Mm-hmm. Um, if you're doing a lot of behavior work, like the reality is the dog is going to have to spend a lot of time in the kennel because they can't be out loose with other dogs when they're not being trained. Mm-hmm. And, you know, just like us humans, like there's just sort of like a cognitive limit of like how much training we can put into a dog in a given day before there's a point of diminishing returns. Yeah on that dog, you know, and then also for the owner, like they have to understand like, Hey, like if you want, like your dog, if it's out of its kennel, it needs one-on-one supervision. I can't just put it loose in a group of dogs. Um, if you want it to have one-on-one supervision for like eight hours a day, like, I don't know that you're going to like the price tag that comes along with that. You know what I mean? Like it's just because, you know, we're dog trainers, like we're not living in mansions and, and, you know, driving Lamborghinis, you know what I mean? Like there's a high overhead it's a service-based industry. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, um, it, it's, there's definitely a balancing there. I think one, like make sure your kennels are like clean and nice and like big enough for the dogs so that the owners are okay with their dogs spending time in the kennel. Um, but we tell people like on average, just like across the industry, again, I, I work with hundreds of professional dog trainers on average in a board and train, most dogs get between 60 and 90 minutes of like focused, hands-on training throughout the day, like 60 to 90 minutes. Usually that's broken up over several sessions. And so is there anything else going on in between that? Like that could depend on the dog. We would have some dogs that are happy go lucky dogs that, yeah, when they're not in training and their training sort of done for the day, so we're not worried about tiring them out, we might just put them in our daycare and let them just socialize with other dogs. We get some dogs that can't do that. And the truth is they're going to have to spend a lot of time in their kennel. And what we want owners to understand is like this is, you know, it's a temporary thing. Like it's a, it's a means to an end for that dog, but the dogs are tired. Like when we're done training for the day and like at my facility, usually like three thirty four, the dogs have had like all of their training sessions for the day. They go in their kennel and like, they are conked out. Yeah. Like the, the amount of learning that's taking place is immense. And, um, they, you know, there's just not a need for the constant activity. And if they were active all day, especially in between our training sessions, it would actually take away from what they can learn, right? Like we don't want them, like, even if it is a dog that we could put in our daycare, we would generally only do that after they were finished. And so by the time we're finished training, it's maybe three, three thirty, four o'clock. Yeah. The daycare is only open for like another hour anyway. So they're still spending most of their time in the kennel. Um, but they get that like that little extra bit of time of play or maybe a pack walk or something like that. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just owners just have to understand like what the program is and, and why, and they have to be okay with it. And if they're not okay with it, that's why it's also nice to offer other things. Yeah. Um, but it's just the reality of a board and train program. It's designed that way for a reason. And part of it, part of that reason is what's best for the dog. Part of it's just the logistics of like, if we're going to do this, this is just the way it has to be. Yeah. And it's not bad for the dog. Like the dog's not suffering in any way, even if like, sure, ideally the dog would be frolicking in a field all day, but like, that's just not reality yeah. in the, in these kinds of programs, especially because a lot of times the majority of the dogs that are coming into board and trains have behavior issues. Yeah. And I think for a lot of people, like, a lot of the owners are okay with it for that reason because they know that it's like hey this is we like we have to do this like for the dog's sake and for our sake like we have to do this and yeah maybe the dog is you know a little bit bored in its kennel for the three or four weeks it's there um but like we have to look at the big picture yeah you know yeah and that's something so you know we try to like every year we look at you know, our programs that we offer and look at, you know, like how can we improve all these services, right? Like what's something that's the weakest point of this and, and how do we address it? And the board and train is one that we've, we've had our eyes on. Um, that's a lot of the reason why I'm, I'm sparking a lot of these questions. We've had our eyes on as far as like, you know, what are some things we could do to improve on this? Because I do see the direction that a lot of the dog training industry seems to be moving in. And I want to make sure we're separating ourselves from that mold, right? And yeah. avoiding a lot of those things that are common issues, but figuring out ways to, to continue reducing them, right? And so one thing that that is, like just to interject a no, little you're bit, fine. You're um, fine. because again, it does pertain to like your your business too. So, so one thing that we started doing 
at the training center that I think is super helpful for a lot of these dogs is, you know, at one point we transitioned our daycare away from like a sort of more traditional, like free play socialization style daycare and into um, what we would call like an enrichment based program. So again, even with the daycare dogs, they're spending a a certain amount of time, like, you know, in a kennel or, or like in an X pen, um, and then coming out for more individualized sessions of enrichment based activities, whether that's some kind of nose work or foraging activity or Mm -hmm. socialization or a pack walk or agility work or some light obedience training, whatever it is. Now, one thing I want to say, first of all, just kind of to this whole topic for any dog owners is previously the daycare, the dogs were out all day. So some of these owners would drop their dogs off at eight in the morning and not pick them up till five at night. And the dogs were out playing all day. And then we transitioned into this model where the dogs were again, in an X pen or in a kennel for most of the day and coming out for usually again, three enrichment sessions. Mm -hmm. Immediately the feedback we were getting from owners was how much calmer their dogs were at the end of the day and how much more tired their dogs were at the end of the day. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Meaning the dog being out of the kennel playing all day isn't necessarily the most mentally enriching and satisfying experience for the dog. Doing things where they can mm-hmm. focus their mind is way more satisfying, even if it's in shorter doses. Yeah. But what we started to do then, what was cool is we had enrichment staff who is, you know, they may not know how to like, you know, fix reactivity or how to introduce an e-collar, but they know how to do this enrichment stuff. And so we can have them also get the board and train dogs out for a little bit of enrichment work as well. Even if it's just one session, it just gives them that extra little thing where it's like, yeah, on top of your dog's training, they're also going to get, you know, some time out to do these things. And what's cool about some of the enrichment stuff is as a trainer, even if you don't have the extra staff or the time to do it, like get a few X pens and put some like tie backs on your wall so you can anchor dogs in for safety and stuff like that. But one of the things that we find most satisfying for a lot of these dogs are foraging based activities. Yeah. Meaning like we would like, like we have a, a, like one of the, the most common things we would do is we have a kiddie pool, like from a dollar store. And then you can buy like those plastic hollow balls, like they use in ball pits for kids to jump in. And we would fill the kiddie pool with the plastic balls and then drop kibble in it. And the dogs just have to forage around and find all that kibble and the dogs freaking love it. And it's really mentally stimulating for them. Very similar to like a food puzzle or like, you know, a snuffle mat, those kinds of things. Those are really easy things to do. So like I can bring a dog out, I can set it up, bring a dog out, put them on a tie back with an X pen around them. So there's safety there. If other dogs are around too, and they can be doing that activity while I'm working another dog on like recalls. And, and, and that dog doing foraging is providing a nice distraction for me. If I'm at a, if I'm at a point where I'm doing distraction work with this dog. Yeah. Right. And so there are things we can do that don't take a lot of extra time and energy that can add a lot of value yeah. to the dog's experience while it's with us, but also that the owners really like, like yeah. they like the idea of their dog having this extra activity. That's just sort of like a mentally enriching and stimulating sort of bonus activity that they're doing. Yeah. Um, so just little things like that. When you yeah. talk about like, how might we improve our program? adding in enrichment based activities to the program, I think can be huge for the dog's emotional well being while they're in your care. And I think you'll also see less of that, like paw licking and things like that, that you see less of the excessive drooling in the kennels, um, less biting at the kennels where they can damage their teeth and things like that. Um, so it can really benefit in a variety of different ways. Yeah. It's funny. You said the thing about the enrichment daycare, cause we maybe six months ago, seven months ago, recently switched to something very, very similar to that. We used to do our, uh, we did, I think it was Monday through Thursday, you know, daycare, which was your standard, whatever, 12 hour shindig, you bring them in, they come play, then they go home. Right. And we switched that mostly because of space and because, you know, obviously when you're dealing with a daycare where the expectation is all of these dogs are going to be out together for this entire time. Like there are some dogs that just don't mold well with that. And unfortunately, yeah. no matter how, how good of a trainer or a daycare runner you are, you can't keep your attention on 20, 25 individual personalities as effectively as you can with one or two, right? So whatever. So we switched to doing same deal, three segments where we would dedicate, um, the dogs would get one social time where we would pick, you know, three other dogs that we thought were going to be a very good fit of temperament for this individual dog, right? So that dog got 100% undivided attention 
And from a social standpoint, right, we noticed immediately almost every single dog that came into our care for that daycare thrived so much more. They had so much more fun. A lot of the dogs that were shut down in a corner because the energy was just too much in a daycare type setting completely opened up. Like we noticed socially these dogs thrive from it. We implemented uh, a training session as a second thing that they did where we would just work on a couple of really, 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 really easy, basic things to get their mind working. And then we would go do uh, structured pack walking with the dogs once a day. And it was same deal. Like the first week we opened it up, we had dogs that had been coming for years to daycare and immediately they were like, our dog is 10 times more tired from this. When in mm-hmm. actuality, like you were yep. saying, they're, they're only out in total an hour and a half, you know, an hour and 45 minutes yep. or something like that, as opposed yep. to 12 hours. Yeah. And so it, it, that's really comparable to what we were just talking about with the board and train, yeah. right? Where we say, yeah, your dog's going to get 60 to 90 minutes of hands-on work, but like, trust me. Yeah. Like after each 20 minute session, your dog wants to go take a nap. Like yeah. they want to go into their kennel. Like they're going to be, yeah. they're going to be kind of tired, you know, you know? Where, um, where I've always struggled with it a little bit and it is, you know, we know this as trainers, but it's still hard. So you figure, right. Like if the dog's getting 90 minutes of one-on-one training a day, right. Figure three 30 minute long potty runs four 30 minute potty runs, you know, you're still talking like. 21 hours a day roughly you know outside of miscellaneous enrichment things you may be doing with them that there's a possibility your dog may be spending in a kennel right that is from the mind that is a long time looking at it you know what i mean so my question is one um obviously i guess your opinion on that you've already spoken with but two are there things that don't involve you know our physical time in order to provide more enrichment. So have you experimented with things like, um, you know, daily or by daily uh, frozen Kong games, other enrichment type puzzles and stuff like that, that don't take as much time. And have you noticed a big change in the dogs from doing those things? Yeah. Well, that's kind of what I was talking about, like using, cause you can do like Kongs in the kennel and stuff like that, but also, like I said, bringing the dogs out and you can have them on a tie back. You can have them working on a food puzzle or doing some other kind of like, like, like the foraging stuff. You know, any kind of foraging based activity where they're kind of using their nose and searching around, it's really mentally stimulating and really calming for dogs. Um, and like just does not take almost any effort yeah. from off. We can put three dogs out at once and have them all doing separate foraging things on tie backs and, you know, for 10, 15 minutes. And, you know, again, by the end of that, they're like really satisfied and kind of chilled out. And it just yeah. doesn't take it's just not time consuming on our end. So I think that's sort of like the big thing Um, to your point about like the dogs spending that much time in your kennel. If you look at like the average, like non puppy, like dog in a household, they're sleeping like 18 hours a day. Yeah. I mean, like realistically they're sleeping overnight, but they're sleeping like a, like Charlie's behind me sleeping right now. Yeah. You know? So, um, like most people, like they take their dog for a 20 minute walk. When they come home, what does your dog do? It takes a nap. Like most dogs go and lay down and sleep after yeah. that. Yeah. Dogs sleep a lot. Like mm-hmm. it's just the reality of it. Um, but even if it, even if it were, I guess my point is like, even if it were less than ideal, we have to look at it yeah. from a cost benefit analysis, right? Like it has to be like this utilitarian thing. Like, yes, it sort of sucks right now for the dog, but like, it's going to open up so much more possibility for the dog right now in the future. And honestly, I don't think it sucks right now for the dog. I yeah. don't because I've done board and trains with thousands of dogs 100%. and they thrive yeah. while they're, they're dying to come back. Yeah. The, 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 from, from 2018 to this year, you know, um, we started having the dogs go home on the weekends. Yeah. We didn't keep dogs over the weekends. That. We did a five day a week board and train. We did a lesson on every Friday or Saturday morning. Dogs go home. They come back Monday. The dogs are thrilled to come back. Yeah. Like they're thrilled. They love it. They love coming back when their owners come on Fridays. They're like, Oh, you're here. Okay. Like it's not like the dogs are dying to go home. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Like, so, uh, they're having a good time when they're with us, you yeah. know what I mean? So, um, yeah, I, it's just not that big of a deal. Yeah. I think it's just not that big of an issue, but I think again, um, those kind of foraging activities, treat puzzles, frozen Kongs, those are all great things that you yeah. can throw in and it can make a really big difference. Yeah. You know, I think, I think size of kennel is extremely important as well. Like you were saying, like we recently, uh, I made a 
uh, a stomach churning investment in uh, 48 inch <laughs> impact crates, <laughs> like the the big mm-hmm. like Great Dane size ones that they have, oh, boy. and and finally mm-hmm. upgrading from some of our standard kennels that we used to have to those. From the sheer standpoint of like 99 percent of the dogs that come in, like that is going to be a substantially larger space that they're going to be able to spend their time in. It's not going to provide a lot of the issues like some of like we have some of the KBC kennels that have like rougher floors that they're on and stuff. Obviously, they're smoother things like that. They're more secure. They can't injure themselves as much on them because they're all the uh, mm-hmm. obviously the high anxiety yeah. ones. Obviously, we don't have the space to have you know ten to twelve full sized kennels necessarily, but continuing to be able to provide better for these dogs in addition to some of those mm-hmm. other things, I think is extremely important. And I know you've always had kennels and stuff like that, like full size ones. I think one of the yeah. first times I came out, you had the Mason kennels installed. Um, mm-hmm. So I think that's something yep. else that people yeah. uh, should look at as well if they're spending more time, obviously in them. How can we provide them more yeah. space as well? So exactly. Yep. Yep. Cool. Um, all right. So moving from that topic here. So um, I think, you know, so both you and I, I remember when we started getting into all the Brandon Fouché stuff for a little bit, right? And focusing on some of the mm-hmm. uh, socialization side of things and focusing on, you know, kind of detaching from some of the obedient stuff and focusing on some of the more behavioral side of things. You know, I look at, so back to a point we were talking about earlier where we were saying everybody lives a different life with their dogs, right? I live a life with my dog where I don't really use obedience commands that much at this point, right? They're obviously highly important and I use them for management purposes and when guests are coming in the door and things like that. But 99% of the success that I've had with my dogs and the reason why I live what I consider to be a good life with them is because my dogs understand the rules and boundaries of living in the house, right? And additionally, Mm -hmm. they are what I would consider to be well socialized, meaning I understand what they need in order to thrive in a social setting so I don't need to manage them so much with commands and stuff like that, right? Um, Mm -hmm. How do we balance out in the dog world where, you know, when we learn about dog training, we learn about how do I teach a command? How do I enforce a command, right? How do I train these different complex behaviors and stuff like that? When in actuality, a lot of the long-term success we see clients have comes from once they've learned those obedience commands, learning how to then phase them out and actually teach the dog what's expected of them. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think, you know, again, this is one of those areas where I think there are some pretty big holes in like traditional dog training education, Mm -hmm. um, is like this area right here. Like most of the dog training schools are very obedience focused. They teach almost nothing about solving behavior problems. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times the behavior problem, like modules of the schools are really like, so teach the obedience and then use that obedience to give all this structure and the dog does place commands and is in in, like, they're always in command and all this kind of stuff. I mean, that's what I learned in the beginning too. Um, and they're not, we're not really like teaching about like breaking down the behavior problems themselves. So I think, you know, part of it is, um, rethinking like what dog training is. So for instance, um, my friend, um, Forrest Mickey, who I know that, yep. like, you know, who Forrest is right. Yep. Super talented trainer in the sport world. Um, he reached out to me a couple of weeks ago because he had a friend who works in a shelter who reached out to him. And basically the, the question he posed to me was like, you know, what's the advice you would give somebody who's like just adopting a dog. And I, I said, well, like, do you want advice on like, you know, what to do, like, just like actually do when they get that dog or like training advice. And he's like, well, how about both? But for here, I'll focus on the training advice. Um, and the advice I gave was like, you know, when they start training, rather than focus on the like traditional five commands, think about like, what skills do you need your dog to have to be successful with you? Such as like, I need my dog to understand rules around like what happens when I open my front door. Mm -hmm. Right. And so a lot of people, they know like, Hey, if I want to teach my dog to do it down, like I'm going to set it up this way. I'm not going to wait until the moment when I actually need my dog to down and try and teach it to him in that moment. Like I'm going to take this time out of my day and we're going to practice downs and I'm going to break the exercise down into parts and we're going to do repetitions, right? We're going to do 10 minutes of repetition. We're going to do that two, three times a day. We're going to do it multiple days in a row and we're going to make progress right? Very rarely do people approach these sort of life skills in the same way. Like very rarely do we find our clients just going, you know what? Like one of the big things that I need my dog to do, like I said, is maybe just understand 
what is the expectation when this door opens? Mm -hmm. You know, maybe the doorbell's ringing, maybe I just need to check my mailbox, whatever, but what's the expectation? And so rather than wait to when I have to open the door because somebody's there or because I have to go outside, like we're going to set aside some training time and we're going to we're going to build a training session around this activity and train it with the same mindset, right? Like you said, is it, is it a skill issue or a mindset issue? And I think here it's a mindset issue that this is dog training. We're not teaching sit down, stay. We're teaching this is what I need you to do in this context. This is what my expectation. My friend Lynn Bokey, who's a really talented guy as well, he calls them uh, uh, behavior expectation drills yeah. is the term he uses, I like that. right? Yeah. So again, like how, what, how big of an impact is it going to make on your success with this dog if your dog knows how to sit on command versus how big of an impact is it going to make on your success living with this dog if it knows what are the rules around the door? Yeah. Right. And so just sort of reprioritizing our training a little bit, I think, can go a really, really long way. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, right, at the end of the day, and this is something that actually, you know, to to name drop Bart Bellin again. But one of the first times I ever met him, he 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 said this thing because, you know, Bart's known for innovating some very, very innovative um, <laughs> dog training techniques. But like he would say. He would say, you know, there's nothing new in dog training. Like dog training has been the same for 50 years. There's been nothing new in 50 years. There's just different ways of applying the same old skills. Yeah. And so there's nothing really new or different about what Caesar Milan is doing versus what an obedience trainer is doing. They're just putting their focus on a different area of learning. Yeah. Right. So if you look at somebody like Caesar or like Brandon Fouché or then juxtapose it against somebody like Michael Ellis. Right. Yeah. When what they're doing is working, it's working for the same reasons. When it's not working, it's not working for the same reasons because it's boiling down to the same principles of learning. Right. If you watch Caesar Milan's work carefully, like he may not be able to define negative reinforcement, but sure. that dude is a master at executing yes. negative reinforcement. He uses a tremendous amount of negative reinforcement in his yeah. work, and he does it with the precision of like a heart surgeon, 100%. right? Yep. And so he's applying negative reinforcement not to sit down, stay, yep. but to, you know, behavior problems, right? And same with punishment, right? Like his application of punishment in most cases, I've seen, obviously, I've seen him make mistakes and sure. do things incorrectly yeah. you know we all do we just you know the rest of us have the benefit of not having a cameraman yeah. following us around but like <laughs> let's face it like we all, all do some dumb yeah, shit yeah. just usually for most of us nobody's looking it's not broadcast on cable television um but you know again he's just really good at using punishment yeah right and like understands the well like he like he may not be able to articulate in like yeah. an academic sense the principles of it but intuitively, he, he just sort of has a gift yeah. where he just kind of gets it and does it really well. Um, so I think like in a lot of ways, it's a matter of like traditional dog training and traditional dog training education has sort of really focused the spotlight like heavily, like very heavily on one area of being obedience and then just like sort of neglected these other things. And all I'm really trying to do in a lot of my work is like, let's share that spotlight a yeah. little bit. Like there are these other areas of the dog's life that we need to put some energy into and we need to put some thought into, Yeah, you know? Um, and so like, you know, again, like I see this all the time with like to go back to like trainers that they get like a lot of balanced trainers, you know, 10 years ago, or I say 15 years ago, maybe balanced dog training was really like compulsion based dog training with yeah. a little bit of praise and, a, and the occasional treat. Right. But like they weren't using food in a really constructive way. And then along comes Michael Ellis. Yeah. Right. And again, he wasn't the first person to do this, but because of his partnership with Learbird, they were able to popularize it yeah. and get the message out to the balance training community more effectively. Because Ivan Balabanov was already doing this. Bart Bellin was already doing this. But Michael was really good at getting attention on it. And all of a sudden, balanced dog trainers were learning how to use motivational-based training, food-based training, yeah. right? And a lot of that is based around, like, building motivation, building drive, like, chasing the food, like, all these. And, like, all of that's good, but sometimes it's not, right? Like, sometimes we're, we're spending so much attention teaching the dog to go after things. Yeah. But, like, well, sometimes going after things is, like, the dog's problem, yeah. right? Like. <laughs> 
And so it's like, it's not that that's bad, but it's just like such a heavy emphasis on it that you get these like completely jacked up dogs where they're like, you know, raring to go all the time. I had a young lady come out to visit me. um, One of the only shadow programs I've done in the past couple of years and a really talented young trainer. She had a Malinois that she was doing PSA work with, but, and doing a really good job in her PSA work, but struggling with him in her personal life. And one of the areas was walks. Like he was so cracked out on walks all the time, like just vibrating with energy. And when we looked at what she was doing with her dog, all of her attention, when she's like, you know, um, putting purposeful work into the dog was built around more drive, more motivation, chasing the food, chasing the toy. That's, that's when I'm giving you my full attention. Yeah. Yes, the dog is having calm times. When the dog's having calm times, it's just like we're doing nothing. Like I'm not putting energy into that. And it's just like, but what if you took some of that energy you're putting into like all these drivey activities and put the energy into actual drills and activities where it encouraged your dog to go into a calmer state? It encouraged reinforcing lower states of arousal. It encouraged not having the dog chase the food, but maybe moving away from the thing they really want instead of moving towards it. Maybe instead of trying to achieve it, giving up the idea of achieving it. In fact, one of my most popular exercises and online courses I have right now is called food claiming. And it's not really about food. It's about teaching the dog that sometimes the path to success is to stop trying. Because so much of our dog training education is focused around make the dog try really hard to achieve the reward. But what if the dog's trying too hard to get things it wants? Like, what if we need to spend time on teaching the dog, you know what, like, just give it up, like, get the idea. How many of these reactive dogs we see is because they see another dog and they're just, they want to get to that dog. They're trying so hard. And what if we had an exercise that said, hey, when I do this, when I give you this signal, it means let that idea go. Yeah. And if you let that idea go, you have a higher probability of getting the thing you want. And that's what we're doing in food claiming. It's like, here's this thing that you really want. And we're going to teach you to let go of the entire concept that you might get this thing. And when you do that, when you show me that, like you get it, that, that, that thing is off limits, you've given up the idea of getting it. That's precisely the moment that we're going to reinforce you. Yeah. Right. And I always say there's a huge difference between reinforcing a dog for nothing and reinforcing a dog for no reason. Yeah. Those are not the same thing. And a lot of people could benefit from a lot more of reinforcing a dog for nothing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Meaning if I've got a dog who's a little bit reactive or maybe just a little bit overstimulated and I've got it in a room hanging out with me and somebody opens a door to come in the room and that dog does nothing reinforcing that yep. right that's like a, a very tangible concept of this but we can build even better exercises around this concept which is what food claiming basically is and that's very different from like i'm just giving my dog treats for the hell of it yeah right for no yeah. reason yeah. not intentional behind it so again i think it's just there was a really long-winded answer to your question but i think it oh, really boils great. down yeah. to like the, the the spotlight's been a little bit um like we just need to reprioritize a little bit um you know a lot of our modern dog training like the classes that we teach the structure of our lessons the things that we're teaching they're born out of training programs that date back 40 years from like old 4-h clubs and like when you just see like kind of the the country boy running group classes in the parking lot of a feed store right um and our lifestyles with dogs have changed dramatically yeah. since then, like really dramatically. So it makes sense that maybe we should rethink the kinds of things that we're teaching because our, our expectations for what our dogs need in order to be successful in this world have changed. Yeah. Right. But, you know, mm-hmm. again, like the models of dog training haven't, like we're still teaching as a priority, sit down, stay, come heal. Yeah. And those things have value, like they're good but they don't have the same value for every client. You know, some clients come to me and like, honestly, like a sit stay is going to make such a minuscule difference in their life, but there's something else I can focus attention on. That's going to make a massive difference in their life. And that's where we want to sort of develop our skills as trainers. Again, it's a huge thing that I coach people on is like, well, how do we figure that out? What are the questions that we need to ask when we're doing this intake with a client to help us focus our training in the right place? And then how do we then take that information 
and build our training programs around it in a way that's really efficient. Where right out of the gate, yeah, we're doing exercises for this person that are making a difference in their quality of life. Yeah. And what you find when you do that is you get a happier client. You get a client who's more engaged and who does the homework because the homework is relevant to their life, to what they're paying yeah. you for. Yeah. Everybody you know has, I, mean? I, you know, one thing I, I talk to people a lot that are having struggle, you know, we'll see a lot of troubles in one-on-one sessions. They're not following through. They're not following through. They're not following through. And I always say, nobody is going to pay you money to do literally nothing. Like that's not going to happen. Everybody has a pain point of something specific they hired you for. And as long as they truly understand how the things that you're having them do are going to directly solve that problem, they're going to do it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, there, there's exactly. very few exceptions to that, I find. And it's funny that you brought yep. up, you know, uh, Caesar, because one of my things I had on here was, you know, like, how do we find the balance between guys like Caesar and Fouché and actual high level obedience trainers? It's funny. My wife and I started like a couple of weeks ago rewatching um, The Dog Whisperer because it's on Disney Plus. <laughs> and, mm-hmm. you know, it's funny. Like, first off, what a wild show. Like, I don't know if you've watched it recently ever in Eclipse. Yeah. Talk about raw, yeah. man. That was a raw show. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. But the cool thing about it is, like you were saying, like he highlights the problem. You know what I mean? Like if your dog is having issues with the front door, like you said, or during mealtime, the dog is whatever, having issues with impulse control stuff around that area, he's going to come up with a solution and something you could work on while you're doing that thing to actually solve that problem head on. And yes, there's so much benefit to creating structure in a dog's life. And there's so much benefit to working commands and keeping them mentally stimulated. If anything, the obedience training is like the enrichment that you're providing for them. But in the end of the day, Mm -hmm. you have to come up with, this is how we're going to work through this specific issue and it's gonna have to be practiced in that scenario there's not really a way around that you know yeah i think if i had any criticism of caesar it would be that he doesn't always have a way of taking the skill that he has and breaking it down into a way that makes it accessible for the average person yeah and so that's when we can start to marry these things together where you take somebody like a michael ellis or an ivan balabanov who's this high level sport trainer or some of the people out of the pure positive world right like look at bob bailey yeah Look at, um, you know, again, like my friend Emily Larlam, look at Ken Ramirez, look at the way these people are breaking down concepts into really achievable set goals Mm -hmm. and building skills and saying, how can we take, you know, ultimately, if what Caesar is doing is applying negative reinforcement more directly into this problem, well, are there component skills that we can develop in the client first that like kind of lead them into that yeah. or for the dog that lead them? In? Like sometimes my criticism of Caesar would be like, he just kind of dives head into an exercise and the dog would benefit from a bit of foundation yeah. in something else or breaking that into its component pieces. I mean, that's one of the things yeah. that the the positive only trainers really brought to the table and are exceptional at is splicing behaviors into component parts. Yeah. Right. And, um, and then, you know, again, how do we articulate it? How do we teach it? And, and, and that goes to, for both the dog, with the, the skills that we need the dog to have, but also the skill that we need the person to have. Yeah. So what I try to do, again, with the trainers that I'm working with is we work on developing the skill of, again, focusing first on our goals. And then when we take that goal, we say, okay, what this owner need, like maybe, again, it's that their dog just goes blasting out the front door every time they open it. Let's just, it's a simple thing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, okay, well, what, what, what exercise do we think we're going to want to do with the dog like directly for that like how are we going to set that up because ultimately if we don't ever open the door and like do something like how is the dog going to ever learn that right so what's the exercise going to be or like here's actually a better one still make more sense i think from a behavioral standpoint um i recently was working with a trainer who had a rescue dog she was helping out with and the dog had bit somebody and, and sort of the context that it bit somebody was the dog was um, laying next to the foster owner on a dog bed and somebody came and sat down really close to the dog and then sort of like reached towards it to pet. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, okay. Like, yeah, like the dog needs exercise and structure and blah, 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 blah. Right. Like all these things. But like, at some point, if we're going to rehabilitate this, like we've got to actually like just recreate that scenario. Like we got to put the dog in that position Mm -hmm. and like something different has to occur. Yeah. Right. So, what do we expect as trainers of what we want to be able to do? Maybe our goal, let's just say that our goal is going to be that we want to teach the dog that if it's in a dog bed, and I'm not saying this is the only way to approach this, but we want to teach the dog that if it's in a dog bed and somebody comes into its space, 
that we wanted to just get up and walk away, mm-hmm. right? That that's how we want the dog to deal with feeling threatened is by getting up and walking away. So rather than what, like what you might see somebody like Caesar do where he just be like, okay, let's put the dog in the bed. And like, here we go. And like, we're going to do with it. Like, well, what if we like worked on a little bit of recall first so that like when that person approaches, like we can be behind the dog and we can say come and the dog has a really good foundation in knowing what come means and like how to walk away from that scenario. What if we also develop some like reward markers? What if we know that if this dog is going to react, that we're probably going to want to be able to correct it, but there are so many different ways you can correct a dog and we don't know how the dog might react to those various corrections. So let's take some time and establish what are our corrections going to be? What are our signals? Like our, our punishment marker, like what's that going to be? Um, so like, what are the building blocks that we're going to need for this to be successful, you know, and let's establish those building blocks first. So we started with the end thing we're going to want to do. We're going to want to put the dog on a bed. We're going to want to have somebody approach we're going to want to teach the dog to turn and walk away from that. Okay, great. So what are the skills we need? We're going to need recall. Maybe we're going to want to place commands that we can actually get the dog on the bed to start with and then like wait till they rest a little bit. You know, we're going to want to establish our reward markers. Um, You know, we're going to want to have some means of correcting the dog. So let's introduce whatever tool we're going to use for correcting the dog sort of away from this problem and make sure it works the way we want it to. And so then those become our focal points as we go into training. We're not going to go, well, I start every dog with leash walking and place command and blah, blah, blah. We're going to go, no, like, how are we going to want to deal with this problem? And then let's reverse engineer it. What are the component pieces for that exercise that we're ultimately going to want to do? And then those things become my priorities going into training, right? And so there are so many different ways that this can manifest depending on the behavior problems that we're working with. But Again, this comes back down to goal setting. It comes back down to breaking things into component pieces. Like you said at the start of this conversation, like one of the reasons that um, like you reached out to me initially after watching one of my online courses was it was one of the first times you saw somebody take, you know, reactivity and break it down into like a kind of a process. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And so that's that is, I think, where you can marry, like, you know, you can take the 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 teaching skill and the technical learning, you know, of some of these high level obedience trainers. And all you're doing is applying those same principles to behavior. You know what I mean? Now, again, not all behavior fits nicely into the operant conditioning box. Like there are some sort of other things you have to understand. I think having a good grasp of the ethology of dogs as they live with humans is, is really useful. Um, Ethology being like instead of you know like behaviorism is the study of like how can we manipulate behavior ourselves. So generally, behaviorists operate in like controlled settings. The ethologist observes how an animal behaves in its natural setting. When we talk about dogs, its natural setting is living with humans. So having an understanding of how relationships can impact that, how living environment can impact its behavior, like all of these types of things. There's a, there's a lot of moving parts here, yeah. um, but again, like you want to take that analytical approach of the high level obedience trainer and the more direct focus on behavior of somebody like Caesar or somebody like Brandon Fouché, um, who there's a a lot of cool stuff there. There's also a tremendous amount that I disagree with. Um, but you know, and, and you can be like a high level skilled nuanced behavior that goes into behavior problems with a with again the precision of a heart surgeon like i remember when i first um a few years ago so my friend lynn Voki that i mentioned he he's worked with caesar since before the show like him and caesar go way way back um they don't work together as much anymore but they go way back and one of the times i was out in la teaching lynn happened to be at caesar's place and they invited me over to hang out for a day and i was talking to lynn and i, I said you know one of the things i appreciate about what's going on here is i feel like a lot of us dog trainers that come from this traditional education, again, when we're taught to approach things from an obedience standpoint first, and even when a dog comes in for a behavior problem, it's like, step one, do all the obedience training and add all this structure. And yes, in some cases that will solve the problem, but it's like this really scenic route, yeah. right? Or it's just like, get in there and cut out the cancer. Yeah, You know what I mean? And so I feel like that's a little bit more of what somebody like Caesar is trying to do. He's just trying to get in there and cut out the cancer. Unfortunately, sometimes he's getting in there in a rather crude way. 
Yeah. So instead of having like the, the, the like Da Vinci, like surgical robot, you know <laughs> what I mean? Like he's, he's using like a, like a hammer and chisel, right? Like some, <laughs> sometimes it's just yeah. leaves a little bit to be desired, but mm. what if we could have take that idea yeah. and Fine, use the dude. Da Vinci yeah. surgical robot, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I think that's kind of what people like myself are trying to do yeah. where we are trying to focus really on the behavior, teach people how to assess a behavior problem, how to break it down into component pieces, how to actually address that behavior yeah. like directly directly without all the extra fluff yeah and sometimes there are some obedience things that are useful right but like just directly get in there and deal with that but do it in a technically precise manner yeah you know what i mean i'm, I'm, I'm so 100 percent with you and and i think the biggest takeaway from all of this i think for myself and for everybody else is and and you just articulate it so beautifully is the way that you're able to, and and when I speak with trainers and stuff, try to articulate this stuff and talk about this stuff and compare it. And it's like, okay, well, this person is doing it this way and this person is doing it this way. And I like this about this and I don't like this about this. And this is where this could be more precise. The more you could train your brain to look at all of what's going on in this ridiculous world of dog training and make sense of it and then be able to spit it back out to somebody in a more clear way, the I, I just I think that is truly the thing that's missing right now in most of the dog trainers that I see. And that's yeah. the one thing I try to get people to do. It's like I try to just like check this resource out, check this resource out, check this out. But it's like you got to just start digging in and learning and just have somebody that's going to be there to help dissect that information for you if you need that assistance, you know? And I think you're yeah. just going to be such a better trainer because of it if, if you could figure that out, yeah. you know? And question things like don't take anything yeah. just because I uh, said so. 100%. Don't take anything because anybody said so. 100%. It should make sense. I've always said I've, I've always used this line: good dog training should not require a leap of faith. Yeah. You know what I mean? It yeah. just shouldn't. It, nobody should tell you that you just have to like buy into their sort of belief mm-hmm. system. Yeah. It should make sense. It should be logical. Yeah. You know, and I think that's what the clients are looking for when we say like, "Oh yeah, I know your dog's leash reactive, but it's super important that you do two hours of place command around your house every day." Well, like. That's requiring the client to take a leap of faith. Yeah. You're asking them to do a lot of work on faith. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I'm not saying that that won't necessarily be helpful, Mm -hmm. but is it the most direct way that we can help them? Is it the best use of our resources? Is it the best use of their energy? If we want them to follow through, if we know that the average client's only going to put in like 15, maybe 20 minutes worth of work a day, is that how we want them spending it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or are there other things we can do? That was just going to have a way, way bigger impact. Yeah. But question everything. Yeah. I'm wrong sometimes, and I don't mind admitting that. You know what I mean? Um, but just because you heard something from a mentor or in an online course or on television or in a book, yeah. like question it. It should make sense to you. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, it, it just it should be logical. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. Listen, I know you got to. I know you got to hop off here. Where? Um, I really mm-hmm. appreciate you coming on, man. This was awesome. Mm-hmm. Um. Where where do you want people to find you? I know you're doing obviously most of your your business and trainer coaching and stuff right now. Um, I don't know yep. where you're doing all yep. that through. So I have I have two two places that people can find me best. Um, so uh, consider the dog is my platform for like that's where all my like behavior videos are. My my up to date stuff. I have behavior videos on um, Mirberg as well, um, but like all my current stuff is on consider the dog. It's consider the dog.com. I think it's the best deal in dog training. It's 20 bucks a month. And you can literally, literally hundreds of videos from myself and other um, top instructors. So yeah. um, all my behavior stuff is there. Um, and it's really geared for like pet owners. Um, but we have like, I, I would say at least 50% of our membership are professional dog trainers because it is high level information as well. Um, if people are interested in professional coaching, then tylermuto.com, T-Y-L-E-R-M-U-T-O.com. That's where you can find information about the programs that I'm offering for professionals. And again, we cover behavioral stuff. A lot of people that come to me, it's because they're feeling stuck in their understanding of how to address behavior um, or even, even obedience training sometimes. Because again, I think there are some gaps in a lot of the modern education programs out there. Um, but we're also, a lot of people are coming to me because they're, their businesses have plateaued or they're having issues with employees or they want to bring out employees, but they don't know the best way to go about it. Um, or they want to expand it to facilities, but they don't know the best way to like, it's a big task. Like, how do I, like, how do I do that? Um, and so I'm, I'm helping people with a lot of different things there. Um, we can customize programs, but I do have some set packages and I can package together also with 
like, you know, consider the dog stuff. So you can have access to those types of things as well. So basically consider the dog.com, um, for like, if you just the behavioral focus, um, but I don't do any one-on-one stuff there. Like it's, it's, you know, we do have a Facebook group. We do some group zoom calls. Yeah. Um, but if you want one-on-one, you go to tylermuto.com and that's where you can have one-on-one interaction with me and, um, and that kind of coaching. And that's again, become a huge focus of mine. And it's been great to focus on that because it's a totally different skill set. Yeah. Um, and, um, because I'm working with so many professionals, um, it gives me my finger on the pulse of what's working for people, what's not working for people. And what are the trends in the industry that you may not have if most of your focus is like running your own, your own business versus being aware of what's happening in the industry and how to succeed in this industry. Cause it can be tough. Yeah. hundred mm-hmm. percent. Well, listen, man, appreciate it. Um, we'll have to, we'll have to do it again. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me on. All right, man. Take care. Let's see. Yeah. You.